Okay, uh, while we're waiting for uh, one person to get online here, we can uh, get started here. So it's uh, uh, 902, we'll call the meeting to order. Somebody's, Somebody's mic is on. Howard or Keith, if you're nearby, I don't have any extra mics on in that room. Okay, there we go. There's one budget committee member laptop there that doesn't look muted. Yeah, that needs to be unmuted. That's the central mic, Brian. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so it's... Um, Sounds good now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, testing, testing. I think we're okay now. So it's 9.03. Let's call the meeting to order. Um, first order of business. Are there any public comments? All right. Given that there are no public comments, let's proceed with the agenda. Uh, so first up in the morning, we have a good crowd over in the, in the boardroom there, it looks like. Uh, and I guess we're going to start off with general maintenance. So with that... Let's proceed. Okay, thank, thank, thank you. All right, so Linda Martin will take us through the, the budget, general maintenance, public works, and CPI. Of course, Eddie Wells here to answer all questions along with Novi and the rest of us. So Linda, general maintenance section. Okay, um, line by line, I presume. Section seven. So, yeah, one by one. Okay. Um, payroll um, was uh, payroll, of course, is just a three percent increase for all employees. Over time, we kept um, we did increase that a little to five hundred. Payroll cost um, actually went down a little, based upon last year and this year. Employee support um, we kept at fifteen grand. 1500. 1500, sorry, training. Um, we actually lowered that just due to what's been going on in the last few years. Um, bill labor, we kept at 20,000. Uh, uniforms, um, we lowered actually to this year due to um, employees. We just do not have the same amount of employees in general maintenance as in previous years. Contract services, 10,000, we kept the same. Cleaning supplies, 700, we kept the same. 1,600 for shop supplies were the same. Small tools, we did lower to 800. Um, gas and oil went up higher. Um, it was based upon $2.50. And now this year, due to the increase, it's up to $3.40 is what we averaged. So that did go up. Um, postage, we did lower just because most of the postage does come out of the CPI department. Supplies, um, we did increase just due to the cost of supplies. So we did increase that $500. Um, auto truck maintenance, we did lower to $1,500 due to the um, equipment that we have. Buildings, we kept at $220,000. Equipment, we kept at $100,000. Uh, electricity, we did uh, keep at 3600 Propane gas, we did increase, just to, again, to the cost of the gas. Um, trash removal for general maintenance, we kept at 800 Telephone, we lowered, actually, due to the lowering of the cell phones in the general maintenance department. And water and sewer just increased a little to 215 um, dues and subscriptions, we lowered to 50 just due to the last couple of years. Insurance um, was lowered just a little due to the last couple of years. And permits and licenses, we lowered, again, due to the um, trend in the last couple of years. So bottom line, public uh, general maintenance is basically a flat budget compared to uh, the prior year. Any questions for general maintenance? Yeah, a small item. Um, um, so gasoline, um, we don't seem to be using that much gasoline year to date September. Um, is it is it maybe a clerical error or just usage is down? What what what? 
my price is going up. I mean, miss that. Oh, miss the um, gas and oil. The vehicles are in public works compared to general maintenance. And so that's with the fueling and public works. Yes. So do, do, uh, do we have? Uh, <clears throat> How does it compare? I haven't looked at two comparisons. But... Yeah, I mean, you got sixty-three thousand dollars in public works, for example. That's where all your trucks and everything are coming out of. So should 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 this category be a little less, maybe? No. Uh, no. <laughs> he's saying he's saying. I guess we got eleven thousand nine hundred. Yeah. Only year to date, fifteen hundred. So. Right. What, what number is public works on the tabs? Uh, eight. eight. <clears throat> One second. Yeah, I mean, you could. Hold on. Where's the gas on the public places. works? Right, you got to take the two and the two. Public works, I don't know if that, how that stands. So he's got an increase there, too. Look, you don't know the price. I mean, <laughs> no gasoline between price increases, um, timing, whatever. I don't think it's unreasonable. I mean, of course, if you know, if you want to look at something for a thousand, a couple thousand bucks, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not going to lose sleep either way, Dick. Um, but I mean, that's a tough one to judge. It, it, it's a small variance, but I was just pointing out that it's a clerical yeah. but your right. call. Um, right. Okay. We will when we screw, you know, when we go through back and everything, if we can, and you could see that we do scrub this stuff and we take everything down. Um, but we'll look at it. Yes. Okay. I got a question. The um, the two twenty uh, under buildings certainly uh, needs to be there, but if you look at the actuals from the previous years, you had uh, two twenty five and nineteen, and you had one hundred forty seven k and twenty. And so far this year, you haven't spent anything uh, on repair. So I guess I'm hoping that certainly keep this in there. But are, is there plans to spend this money to make sure we do the deferred maintenance and everything that falls under this category? Yeah, and, and you know, and it, obviously from a variance, uh, Doug, this question definitely has to be asked, and it's been asked here. It's a, co a couple of things I want to address on this, and I'm sure and you agree with me. First of all, the deferred maintenance, we did do a lot with new buildings and everything. We have plans for this year, for this building, uh, and a few other items that we didn't do because of COVID. And right now, I got to see if we can even get to this building. Um, but one thing, and, I, and I'll ask Eddie to nod or disagree with me. If we come up with one major thing or one thing that has to be done, done it's easily a hundred grand. Yeah, I mean we have work down at the uh, just maintenance and stuff that we did last year at the uh, at the beach club. So this is that deferred maintenance. It's there. Mm -hmm. I, I think if we ever take it down, that's the year we're going to need it. Um, we certainly will be eating into this. Um, it's because of the COVID. Have been a couple other things. Yeah, yeah, we've we've actually got some projects that we're working on now that we're waiting on material. Some things we've ordered six months ago. It's just right. not being able to get the material right away. It hasn't hit the books yet, but it is coming up and it will be done. Right. To be quite honest, in general, for a place this size and everything, two hundred thousand, just a round number, Doug, two hundred thousand for maintenance is not a lot of money. I mean, as soon as you get one thing, or if something happens, or whether it's the decking down, it, it easily it's a hundred grand. Yeah, and, and trust, I'm not suggesting we take this out at all. I, as a matter of fact, that, yeah, no, I understand. That, that we got, uh, uh, you know, a focus because I know there's a lot of factors like, you know, the avail availability of materials, the right. availability of labor and so on and so forth. Right. So, um, you know, I just want to make sure we're, we're headed yeah. forward with that. And I suggest absolutely yeah. want to keep that in there. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I understand your question is more about where we're at right now. And I think the team we and, I, and I've answered it. OK, thank you. Um, I done. Well, I think Doug and I think the same way. I have the same question, so, so okay. we're good. Okay, okay. Um, kind of hate to bring this up at the same time. But uh, in general maintenance, uh, if we were to work on mailboxes, would it come in this category? <laughs> John, uh, I see you turning around in your chair there. <laughs> okay, so let, let me let me just get my uh, bearings on this thing with the, the Piotti's not up there, is he? For the mailboxes, you're correct. So when we did the maintenance this year, um, it did come out of here. If I have to do maintenance, and you all know that we've pushed back onto the post office, and you know that from many meetings I was in, and I, I, I believe our president and the board sent a letter or whatever, um, but you're correct. 
anything to do on the mailboxes would come out of here. Yeah. And, and I think there is a mailbox or two that we've looked at that we got to do some work on. But correct. Same thing with the bridge. Uh, obviously, that'll come out of here. And you can see we are going to be doing work over the next month over there. Uh, in this category, you, you, in the past, you spent a little bit of money to do some work on mailboxes that need to work. And you can yes. hear the that there'll be a little bit for a mailbox or two. I guess the, the question I'm going to raise now is just the money and funds. Now, in the ideal world, uh, we push back, we wouldn't have to spend it. But I think we got to be prepared for what might not be the ideal world. So given that um, there may not be a funding source, not paint 10 to mailboxes that are just in deplorable looking condition. They may be structurally sound, uh, but they're just horribly looking. Um, uh, I, I, I do believe we need to have a plan that looks at what we need to do there, quantifies how much that costs, and start working on that in the current in the new year. Maybe this year too, but in the new year. Um, I would prioritize those mailboxes that are most visible as you drive up and down the street as being the first, first to work on that, you, that just people see as they drive by. Uh, some of them are, are very horrendous looking. And when you talk about beautification, all the good things we do for beautification, to me, mailboxes still come to the top of the list. Okay, so Dick, so a couple of things on that. First, we, we've gotten some pictures and we've seen some things. We'll go in and fix them at a reasonable rate. What we do and what we're responsible for, and we've been through this before, is the concrete pads. The concrete pads are expensive if need to be done. Anywhere where there's a concrete pad or anything like that, I certainly, and Eddie and I just spoke, we will certainly do that. Um, as far as the mailboxes and all that, you've been adamant about it. One or two of your uh, BNF members, and I get it. Um, I'm waiting to see what the post office says. I've been adamant about that since the beginning. I believe the board supported me on that. Um, we will go in and see what we can do at a reasonable amount. But like I've said before, if you want to start doing this, it's a lot of money. And, and where do I stop and where do I where do I go? But um, I understand if there's mailboxes hanging hanging on the floor and whatever, we'll go in and we'll repair them. That's yep. that's where I'm at right now, quite honestly. I mean, I, I, th I think the next move is the board. The board spoke. I was there and the board said, and tell me if I'm wrong. We got enough board members on this thing um, that that the post office, we were going to push on the post office. If they want me to proceed, I'll proceed. My, my, my sense is from what I'm, well, maybe some board members can speak up here that know some more information here. But um, there's a possibility that there may not be funds there to tend to the mailboxes. And, and, and I think we need to push as hard as we can for those funds to, to, to do the work that we hope that the U.S. government would cover. Right, but the possibility, let me, let me jump just finish here. Let me, let me jump this. Okay. We're wasting time. So I have been in contact as, you know, as I announced the board meeting with Andy Harris' office. I have heard back from their office the, um, and uh, they referred the postmaster in uh, Cambridge uh, to address the issue with me. Um, the indications are that we're going to be responsible for these boxes. Um, the postmaster and I have been exchanging phone calls. Um, but with the additional research that I've done, um, it looks like we're going to be stuck with these things. The, the post office position that um, when this, when, when Ocean Pines was built, but we agreed to uh, uh, be responsible for the boxes uh, is not true. Uh, you can imagine 50 years ago, they had nothing in writing. Uh, that under the, according to the post office, it was their understanding that Ocean Ponds would be responsible for these boxes. Um, that was their understanding. There's nothing in writing. Um, and the only question that I haven't had answered yet is, well, if Ocean Ponds owns these boxes, if we decide to rip them out, then what happens? 
and I can't, I'm not getting an answer back to that question. Now I would look at information for homeowners associations that dealt with this issue in North Carolina <coughs> and South Carolina and the um, uh, both new communities and old communities and the post office, uh, they, their rules are that they are not going to deliver the homes anymore. So at this point, I think we need to, you know, unfortunately, I think we need to recognize that we're probably going to be stuck with it. With, with, we're going to be deemed the owners of these boxes. Uh, we're going to have to go ahead and get them on our um, uh, on the DNA study, and we're going to have to start maintaining them. Uh, I think that's where we're going to end up. Um, but I don't think the response I'm going to get when the postmaster and I finally do get a chance to talk that uh, um, the, the post office is going to do anything. To fix it. So that's that's really the update at this point. So I think what I'm hearing, Larry, is that uh, uh, we should be talking about Outer Bird. We just don't put out their general maintenance. Any more? I don't know where to put it. Yeah. Address needs of the mailboxes. Yeah, I think that's probably we probably should be looking at that. Um, this idea of putting all the covers and everything over these mailboxes, that's a whole different story. Um, I don't think that's, in my own opinion, I don't think all that's necessary. But BS has been very clear on the presentation that we had on that way back when. That's something to support. Okay, so if I could just jump in after getting all this knowledge now, uh, at this point in the budget and everything, and in this year, here's the way I see this thing. I will continue to fix what we see. Anything that's big, and there will be big items, uh, I'm going to need approval from the, apparently BNF has spoken. That's what I just heard Dick tell, tell the board, uh, the president right there. So I will need uh, to be tasked by the board because it will be a big number. Anything within my, my signing authority, we will certainly look at and, and start doing. But what BNF is recommending here is a big number, and it's certainly not something that I can go ahead and do. So we obviously will have to look at this, evaluate it. It's not on our books, um, and then come up with a plan. Outside of pulling from other maintenance, which obviously we didn't have a big number in there for mailboxes, um, we would certainly have to look at that depending on what the board wants me to do. I'm, I'm sure the board, and we'll work on this for the board meeting if we are having a budget review with the board, because I seem to have a, I'm not sure if this is a hybrid meeting with the board and, and, and BNF, but if I do get tasked, to continue the board meeting, which I'm assuming I will, we'll try to have something ready for that. That's the best I can do right now. And speaking for myself, John, and not for the whole board, but I would say that, um, you know, I think, I think the approach that we've taken so far to fix the things that are damaged uh, is the way to go. Right. A wholesale attempt to replace all the boxes um, you're right, it would be a gigantic number, and I don't think right. that's where we ought to be going. Um, All right, let me let me do this. We have uh, Larry, uh, Dick. We do have some studies, you know. We got a bunch of them. Um, we're going to look at it. We'll try to come up with something that we believe is a priority. I know Eddie's been around there. I'm going to take a ride with him, um, and we'll see what we can do based upon the parameters of this budget, what we really believe really should be fixed uh, to get into that beautification word that uh, Dick said, which I agree with him. And then we're gonna have to go further on that because uh, obviously that's something that's not in any budget right now. Okay, I got it. Hey, hey, hey John, quick, uh, yeah. just curious yeah. on a, from an accounting perspective, do we have to realize those assets on our asset list before we can start charging you know, expenses against them? Or is there you know, is, or is there a policy or a, you know, a law that yeah, makes sure we uh, account for that, that expense properly? Yeah, well, first of all, and you're correct, and I brought this up years ago. They're not on the books. For me to go in there and maintenance and expense them, not necessarily. Uh, once we put a big number in there, then it would go on our books. Um, so, for instance, if you would task me to do, you know, I'm just using a number for an example, $500,000. 
when we do a program like that, then to me, and I'll talk to Steve afterwards, to me then, that's when we would put them on the books and that would be a new capital uh, new capital charge, and then thus it would get on our books. That's how I believe it would be done. Um, we're certainly not going to go in there and just automatically put all these mailboxes on our books. Um, first of all, it would have zero value because it didn't cost us anything. Well, so let us let, let Steve let Steve look into this. But that's the way I see this: is that I can go in there, I can maintain them, I could charge our PL or operating mm -hmm. PL with that. Once we get into a big number, the way I believe it would be right now is it's say five hundred thousand dollars. That's new capital, um, and then that that five hundred thousand worth of those mailboxes would be on our books. The other mailboxes would be on there at a zero value. But go, like, give Steve a chance to uh, to look at this, and we'll talk, and we'll get you an answer. But I believe that's the answer. All right, thanks, John. Yep, no good question. Can I say a little something? Um, I'm really sorry. I'd like to say something. I'm sorry that um, that now we're responsible for these. I'm a little disappointed in my government right now. But the um, the fact of the matter is, it's the bases that are bad. They're metal. They cannot handle this type of weather. They're not aluminum. The top parts are fine. So if we own these, why can't we just do aluminum bases? I'd be glad to design it and just put the boxes on that. And that will not cost us anything. Like Can we do that? Put the until we did that. Yeah. So just, I don't know if can you can hear me. So the ones that we replaced, yeah. that's that's what Eddie and the team did. Um, so you have the numbers. If you go back, I, I think it was like for each cluster, Eddie helped me out 1500 or 2500. Yeah. To put those, what you're talking yeah. about, Josette. So to expand on a little bit, we have done a study. We went to every site and we evaluated every mailbox pad, did counts and looked. And we have a list, which we'll work with John and Steve on, of the ones that need to be replaced ASAP and the other ones that don't need to be done right now. It's not like they all need to be replaced at one time. Right. It's just, Agreed. yeah. Right. So we'll try to have that. I think the board, uh, well, first of all, there's it, two, two prong to this. One, obviously, for this year. Um, but I believe I can do that with the balance I have and, and the amount I'm going to spend and the amount of time with everything else that uh, Public Works has going on. And then we'll try to put something together for this budget, uh, this proposed budget, by the time we meet with the board, which I think Steve helped me out. What is this? Wednesday, Thursday? Like 19, 20, 19, 20. 19, 20. So we'll try to have, so Doug, Larry, we'll try, Dick, we'll try to have something, uh, a priority list for that. All right. Thanks, Thanks. Also, yep. I have a question for Eddie. Um, mm -hmm. Eddie, in your study, did you also look at the mailboxes themselves? I'm hearing oh, yeah. there are mailboxes that are yes. leaking. On, okay, so you have a list of yeah, those. Yeah, we actually boxes. looked at the mailbox, the pad that they're built, the entranceway going yeah. into them, plus the actual pedestal that holds the mailboxes. We looked at all of them, so everything. All the, all the components, Colette, were all looked at and they're all broken out in the studies. Okay, and so we'll have a list of the priorities going to be those that need to be replaced based on function, not appearance. Is Correct, that yes, because Thank there's you. some that are actual boxes that are actually missing doors. Back doors are off of them, and like you said, there are some that are leaking. You can say they've been hit or bent, and then as uh, Josette said, there's the bases that have rusted out over time because of the salt and everything else, just the area that we live in. But we evaluated every piece to the mailbox. It's not just the mailbox itself. It's the pads they sit on, plus going into them after it's home. Great. Thank you. So, so Colette, I'll, I'll push back on that a little bit. Um, if I look at my mailboxes, um, some of them structurally are in not bad shape. But they're, they're miserable as far as having green moss going over them. They're miserable as far as having tape and, and remnants of people's putting things on them. Um, it may very well be, and, and John, I do applaud you with your process here, looking at, evaluating, coming up with a plan to support that 100%. That's what we really need to do. But you might find in doing that plan that there are a number of mailboxes that structurally may have 10 years left of useful life. Maybe power washing, maybe spray painting. or cleaning up, I think, oh, spray painting is a... Is something that we should be considering. Okay. Yeah, with the power. So, so yeah, the power washing, just like with the bridge, we can go in there and do that. The only thing I'm going to say is, obviously, it's 30 degrees out there, 20 degrees. We need some good weather, but we'll, we'll try to put that in with this uh, recommendation that we have in a couple of weeks. But that's something we can easily do, and it, it sounds to me like, you know, we'll get uh, a benefit out of our dollar for that. Sure. The 
the whole point is if you have a if you have a structural asset that's going to last for a while, right? It just needs to be freshened up, paid, and cleaned up, right? That, and that that may be, um, um, yeah, an inexpensive. And Dick, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Problem. How to wash the phone of them. Well, you, you, you're going to have to work with yeah. the post office because there can't be any mail in it when you power wash them. You know, so you're going to have to, it, it'll be a, you know, it'll be a joint. Are you going to do that? <laughs> Doing the middle of that. All right. So that, that's a, that, that obviously that's going to take some time with that, coordinating that, but that's definitely a maintenance. That's something going forward that should be done just like the bridge and everything. That, that would be an example of something that comes out of this. 220, but we will look at that as one of the first things to do. Yes. And I also else? wanted to say, just as an item, that these the life of these boxes per manufacturer is only 25 years. So kudos to Ocean Vines. Okay. Anything else on general maintenance? Uh, and uh, George here. The North Bridge entrance, and I think the state had some recommendations there to make some changes or meet some requirements. There is that any in here for ten this year? Like they're drawing the drawings now for the material. Yeah. So yeah, we've done this update, George, and we were going to touch on this. So. The engineers came in. I've been updating the board on this and, and BNF. So the engineers came in. They did their study. They did their review. They put it into the state. We've been waiting for the state to, to, to come back on, on, on what needs to be done. So that's in process, but we don't have what we need to move forward to the next step. Eddie, any idea on the timing of it? Going to the state, I don't know. I mean, you send something to the state, we're going to have to wait, unfortunately, is the way it is right now. It used to be a couple of weeks. I can't guarantee that. We went through our engineering. First off, we contacted the company that does the guardrails that the state is recommending we use. Well, they have, of course, have engineer drawings saying what to make. So we had our engineer look at it. They were designed something, sent it to the state for their approval. Once we hear back, which is hopefully any time, but I can't give you a date. Sorry. And then we'll move forward and we'll get the prices and uh, go from there. Yeah. So as I look at this budget today, the money for that is not in that's actually in this working budget right now that we're in. Right? Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Believe me, we want to do that as soon as we can. So obviously, as soon as we get what we need. Okay. I understand. Is there an estimate on the cost on that? Bigger ten because it's only just the entrances, but yeah. the material. On so the, the, the estimate Eddie has on that, just the ballpark that we've talked about, is we're going to say like ten thousand, fifteen thousand. But you know, prices are going and changing, so that's just to give you the, the board and to be enough to get an idea on what we believe and what we've bought over the last several months that it'll cost, right? Okay. All right, any more uh, questions for general maintenance? Okay, thank you, guys. Okay, thank you, Linda. Thank you, BNF. Good questions, public works. Uh, slide uh, eight, tab eight. Okay, public works, um, line by line, um, county roads. Um, we did increase that um, to 85,000 just because it's been trending higher in previous years. Uh, miscellaneous, uh, 35,000 is proposed. For the payroll, um, due to the increase of uh, the minimum wage, that did increase um, several employees in the Public Works Department, along with the 3% increase proposed. Overtime stayed the same at $20,000. Um, payroll cost went down a little. Um, a question, just go back a minute. Could, could you tell me what's going? What, what, what's behind county roads? What, what are we doing there? So it's revenue. How do you get the revenue ready? They give it to us, the county. And it's based on what? So that's revenue. It's, it's the county's budget, what they budget to give us to help take care of the road. Just the agreement that was made years ago between Ocean Ponds right. and the county. So that's their contribution, Dick, to, <clears throat> to, you know, we maintain some of these roads. Eddie's out there fixing some stuff. Is that a moving, moving amount or is it pretty fixed? It moves, each it moves a lot. It used to be a lot higher, and then it, the bottom fell out back, I would say, in their 2010, 2011, probably somewhere around in then. And it slowly has been building up a little by little each year. 
Okay. 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 Um, Great. Uh, Eddie, how are we doing on the employment? I know we were short a number of people. Uh, some openings are. Are you looking to help us out? <laughs> 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 not breaking down our door. Everybody that comes in, we call and we interview. But um, the biggest thing that kills us, uh, unfortunately, the way I don't want to get into a whole lot of it, but with the government set up, you can sit home and make sixteen bucks an hour and do nothing. And when we're hiring at twelve fifty or thirteen bucks an hour to do the kind of work that we're looking to do, get out and <laughs> shovel snow or get in a ditch and dig, they're not breaking our doors down. So the ones we do get that put in applications are either overqualified or they think they're overqualified and they want 20, 25 bucks an hour just to come do the manual labor that we have to do. So it's it's not just here, it's everywhere. I mean, you talk to the county, talk to the state, talk to Home Depot, Lowe's, it's just, it's hard to get anybody to do the, the labor end of this type of work. Okay, um, we saw how many of them? What are we, five? I think it's about the positions that we kind of, yeah, yeah. I think it's five full time positions. Yeah. So it didn't last year. We kind of, um, we didn't remove them from the, from, from yeah, the three. One to three. It was three four. It was it three? Yeah, Dick. So it was either three or four. Steve's so telling me it's three. I thought it was four. We left, you're right. We left the FTEs there. Nothing was eliminated. We did not fund them last year. Correct. Mm -hmm. Not fund them this year at this point. Did you fund them this year? No, no. We, we did not fund them this year. Uh, that's Larry. We did not fund them. We had a hard enough time filling the spots that we, we had. And it was the understanding that if, in fact, you're able to find people, then the board would have no problem. Correct. What do you say? The board board? If we found people that were fit. Oh, yeah, we'll hire them. We'll hire them. Yeah. yeah, and that's why that's that also that mark to market adjustment I talked about yesterday. We're working with HR and um, working with Eddie, Kathleen, so that we can try to hire people. That's that mark-to-market piece in that uh, category that I gave you all yesterday. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Um, employee support, we kept the 3,500. Training, we kept the 350. Um, bill labor, tw negative 20, as previous. Computer supplies, um, we actually lowered to 1,200 just because of what's been the last couple of years. Um, equipment rental, we lowered to 7,000 um, just because of what we've rented in the last few years. Uniforms, um, we did lower just again into the, into the decrease of employees. Um, so we did lower that to 10,500. Contract services, we kept at 48,000. Cleaning supplies, we did lower um, to 1,250. Landscaping, we kept the same at 73,250. Signs, we kept the same at six. I have a question on landscaping. Um, so what is our, our contractors doing? Are they uh, is drainage work, ditch work, or is it grass cutting? Or ditch work. Ditch work. Most of, the, most of the subcontractors is ditch work. We got we have a lot of ditches in here that I can't get equipment in. They have to be done annual labor. Only way you can get in them and clean them out. And we just don't have the workforce to do it. So that's why we contracted them out. Okay. Um, shop supplies, we kept at 10,000. Small tools, we kept at 1,000. Snow removal, we kept at 10,000. Hopefully we won't get any more this year. Um, gas and oil, as previous and general maintenance, we increased that um, to 63,500 due to the inflation. Postage, um, we kept at 100. And the uh, supplies, we did increase to 7,000 due to the cost of supplies. Auto and truck, we kept at 18,000. Drainage, we kept at 175,000. Equipment, we kept at 40, or sorry, we decreased it to 40,000. Roads and bridges, we did increase um, to 92,000 because that includes a 40,250 for the road stripe and a version parkway. Electricity um, did increase a little to 19,000. 
propane, we kept the 4,200. Um, trash, we did decrease. Um, the reason for the decrease was due to the fact that we are now using the White Horse Park as a dump site for the leaves. And also due to the burning of the brush that we've been doing in the fall. Um, telephone, we did increase due to the number of cell phones to 6,500. And water and sewer just decreased a little to 3,738. 3, Dues and subscriptions, we kept at 250. Insurance went up a little um, just uh, due to the trending of the higher in previous years. And permits and licenses, we kept at 4,050. So a question I have is, with the public, when we have two accidents to the bridge this year, I don't see anywhere in here where we're getting credit for the money returned to us from the insurance companies where they uh, just got it today. <laughs> okay, so first, we when we did this, we did not get back any insurance money, Larry. Um, Steve just whispered to me that he just received something today. Um, Gotcha. When we get those checks, uh, to me, it gets recorded. I, I We don't plan for something like that because, as you're saying, if I have an expense, Larry, of $10,000 i am going to get the insurance back, then that's a wash. And hopefully the insurance goes into wherever we put the, uh, the charge. So to me, the example that you're giving is it should be net. So we don't provide for it. I can come up with a number and put 10,000 in expense and then 10,000 for insurance. I don't see the point on that, but to, to answer your question, that should be a wash. Yeah, except that if we don't, we don't credit it back, John, we're just taking it here as an expense. So Steve, what did you think? Well, he's got it. Well, hold on, Larry, I'm, I'm taught. So he gets the money, he's got it recorded on the books. I have seen in situations, you're right, it may go somewhere else. And then I got this expense out there, which I, I saw with the uh, the Bainbridge. And then I got uh, the papers asking me, and rightfully so, hey, John, you know, you, you, you were overspent, but we had the credit for the grant somewhere else. So like I said, he, he should be, if he charges the expense to that line item and it's insurance, when he gets the insurance, he should net it there. But even if he doesn't, it's on the books and it nets out at the end. And, and it will happen this year. So obviously he just got the check. I'll talk to him after the meeting to see where he's going to record it, but it does get recorded. So net and that's raw bottom line is neutral as what you're asking, Larry. Um, and again, I'm looking at a budget here, not the actual, but I will recommend to him that uh, he offsets where the expenses. That's the, that's the way I did it in a prior life. Okay. Does that work? Uh, listen, John, that, that, that's fine. I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, if we're getting $20,000 back to the- Yeah, bridge, right, right, so that's- To uh, somewhere else. Right, but I got, I got two, right, we're looking at, so I just want to make sure, so, and make sure I understand. So this is the budget. The budget's separate from our actual. In the actual, and you're right, you might have saw before where we had an expense somewhere and it looked like we overspent because other people have said to me, but then when we got the credit, the credit might've been posted somewhere else. And I think this is what your point is. He should really net them in the same account. And like I said, I will talk to him afterwards. So obviously now he knows and we'll do that, but that's, I'm not going to plan for, if the question was with the budget, I'm not going to plan for that. Right. You want me to plan for it? <clears throat> I don't know. I didn't hear him. Yeah, I just, Listen, I just, you know, because there's so many questions on this bridge, there's so much attention within the community. And, you know, right. people are going crazy for the accidents there. I just want to make sure that. Yeah, so, okay, so yes, when he gets the insurance, he, first of all, he definitely records it. He should offset with the expenses. The third is obviously the GM. When I give the updates, I need to say that. I've been saying that with that bridge, that it was hitting two times. I said that, you know, we had an estimated expense. We were waiting for the material and that this would be insurance. So to summarize, he will record it in the same account. Thus, you'll see the zero. And then that should be reported on either in a variance analysis by the controller or the GM. How's that? Is that good, Larry? That's fine. All right.
Yep. No, I agree. <clears throat> All right. What else? Any, any other public works questions? Small detail and again, on the detail page under gas and oil, we still have two fifties for small. Yeah, that was a typo. Yeah, that's just a typo. It, it was up to 340. But the, the total numbers, right? Is okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, so the, uh, the I mean, labor and the bridge repair, those are the driving the, the increase. Here. That's all understandable. Uh, Linda, you did a pretty good job scrubbing this. I can sense spike ups and downs for each line item that you gave it a careful review and let's do it. <clears throat> okay. Moving on to CPI. Look at that. No, I don't know. Let's see. What number? I got some different ones. Six. Tab six, CPI. <clears throat> okay. We, um, the revenue, the, all the fees, um, we did realign. Um, the staff looked at them and just as they were trending, um, so we gave better estimates. Um, so the admin fees, um, we did decrease to 3,000. Inspections, we did increase to 40,070. Following fees, um, we did incre decrease to 16,290. Um, resale certificates, we kept the same um, to 125,000. Um, interest income, we did increase to 1,250. Um, payroll um, is- Linda? Yes? Uh, have we made um, any increases, changes to our fees? Um, the decrease, uh, the Architecture Review Committee is recommending decreasing the variance fee to just a $50 filing fee. Um, due to the fact of the backlash we've had of the ones that have been denied, um, paying $115, um, uh, we get a lot of backlash. So it'll be a $50 non-refundable instead of $115 non-refundable. Yeah, right now it's one hundred fifteen dollars they pay, and that's non refundable. Um, they're trying to be a little more fair and make it a fifty dollar um, fee, a flat fifty dollar non refundable fee. I can't hear. I can't hear you. So, You're loud. It's flat. I can't hear you. I think you got you muted. You are far away. My okay. question. I understand that, Linda. My question is. Don't you think it would make more sense just to leave it at 115 and then if the uh, variance is denied, refund the 115 as opposed to reducing the fee for everybody? Yeah, good. Yeah, no, it, well, that's a good point. We'll do it. Linda, Eddie? Okay. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's a good point. Lad. We'll do it. Hey, a question on that, I th Linda, unless I misunderstood, I thought you said that regardless of whether the variance is granted or not, the 115 is not refundable, correct? Yes. <clears throat> All right. So we, we, in no cases are we refunding any money, uh, you know, when, when an inquiry is made regarding a variance. Is that, is that my understanding? Yeah, that that's properly? correct. Yes. Uh -huh. All right. So then, you know, regardless, we're not refunding any money. So, uh, I mean, to Larry's point, I understand, you know, 115, but... You know, you you you're there with the feet on the ground, basically saying people are a little upset if their variance gets denied, and so would rather have you know the the fifty rather than um, rather than the hundred. I I don't know. I I, I you know, if you've got the data that proves it, and you're making a recommendation that uh, you know it ought to be fifty because of the interaction you've had with Ocean Pines membership, I'm I tend to lean towards that as probably the uh, solution going forward. Yeah, in the past, it's always been non-refundable. Um, it's just that we had we had an architecture review committee that was more lenient. Um, so the architecture review committee just recommended, these, like I said, due to the backlash of decreasing it to fifty dollars. How much money are we talking about here at the end of the year? Um, we had we have average of um, twenty 
like around 22 meetings a year, um, probably two variances per, and probably, I would say this year, probably at least five to 10 where we're denied. It's not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money. Right? No, it's not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money, you're right. So I, I don't, if we're, if we're getting too into the weeds here, but, <laughs> but administratively deal with refunds for such a little bit amount of money. Right. I'm just trying to uh, accommodate. Okay. All right, Dick, what else? All right. Uh, comply. Oh, we were going through compliance, were we? Did we go through it? No, we're still going through it. <laughs> um, starting with payroll. Um, payroll increased due to the 3% um, that is suggested for employees. Error time increased a little to 3,000. Payroll cost um, decreased a little like other departments. Employee support, we did lower to 400. Computer supplies, we kept at 1,000. Legal fees, um, 4,200. Um, this year, we just have not had legal fees due to the courts being closed due to COVID. Um, so we might be getting a hit if they do reopen because um, we have currently 45 in legal. Um, uniforms, we kept at 300. Contract services, we kept at 16,250. Cleaning supplies, 500, we kept the same. Gas and oil, like other departments, we increased due to the higher gas totals. Um, postage, I did lower to 500. Um, we've been trying to contact the um, residents and send them violation letters. If we can, we try to contact them through phone. So we're trying to save a little on the postage. And supplies, um, 2,800, <clears throat> we kept the same. Auto and truck, we kept the 400. Electricity, we kept the 2,300. Propane gas, 3,500, the same. Um, trash removal, we kept the same at 550. Telephone, we kept the same at 4,900. And water sewer, we just increased a little to 215. Um, insurance rates did go up, so that was increased to 2,935. Okay. And uh, resale certificates are the same, kept the same? We kept the same. Um, it's just that they, they've been slowing off a little. The summer season's over, so they're slowing down a little. Yeah. So. Same billing rate? Same billing rate? Same billing rate at 250 per package, yes. We raised it last year, right? No, it's the same. didn't raise it? Uh -huh. No, it's the same. Brian, could I um, just get clarification? I think I heard yesterday that um, regarding the payroll um, costs, a, a lot of the departments, while the payroll <laughs> has gone up, um, there's a lot of savings there going on in the payroll cost field. Did, did Steve, did you say that we negotiated some better um, like insurance premiums for the benefits? Is that why that those are those costs are down? Uh, if you recall, last year during the budget process, we were still uh, not sure what the rates were going to be. So we <clears throat> budgeted what we were anticipating. We ended up coming in better and negotiating better. So what you see there in this current year budget is higher than what we're actually coming in at. So, so this current year, we we lowered it um, based on what we're actually coming in at. We still need to negotiate based on the new fiscal year coming up in, in May. That, and I think John alluded to, you know, there's definitely uncertainty there. You know, it could could mm -hmm. go up. You know, a lot of things, a lot of things come into play there. But based on the latest and greatest information we have at this point, it, it makes sense to take it down from what it was last year. Right. So if I may, Brian and, and Steve, can I just add on to that? So the timing of when we finalize the insurance is basically at the end of the budget process. Mm -hmm. I can I, I can attest since I was on all the calls last year. They started up here by the time the court negotiation, whatever, it winded up down here. But I want to add one piece to that. <clears throat> it has to do also with our mix, with our experience ratio, whatever that term is. I mean, maybe Larry can help me out with that as a term for it. But that kind of changed for us, and it, it was favorable. That can go either way, Brian. Okay. Uh, right now, <clears throat> Steve and I see it, and, and Kathy, is that it's going favorable, thus where we're at with this. 
Okay, very good. I just want to make sure I understand yeah. and get it right in the yeah. minutes on why right, that, that's, that's a good question. That's it's a big number head. in the book. It's a big number in the budget. Good question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. Yeah. What I'm referring to is really it's our workers' comp model, and then we had some workers' comp expenses. It's also the medical. Another few medical. Yeah, Larry, but just, and again, there's two pieces. You are right on the work is comp. Totally agree on this one. And I'll let Steve jump in. This one is the medical, um, but it's the same scenario, Larry. It's based on, I forget the term. I'm hoping somebody will hit me with it. It's like the, the experience history or whatever. Yeah, claim, claims experience. Um, you're right. But you're correct, Larry, in that we did have our mod that went up the last two years. And we've been very good internally with, with our claims uh, for workers' comp. Uh, so that mod has definitely gone down. Um, so that it's a, it's a couple of factors, one being the workers' comp, also the medical insurance rates as well. Yeah. Uh, and to finish my thought, so everyone understands the mod uh, doesn't vary on a year to year basis, spread out over a three year period. So uh, if our experience is getting better, it usually, we usually see the benefit of that over three years. Uh, that's how the underwriters spread it out. So you're not taking a big up or down one year. So that's, we're probably starting to see the benefit there in workers' comp and also uh, uh, the experience with uh, uh, the medical insurance too. Right, and, and just to put that in perspective on a timeline, so obviously a year ago, we were kind of going this way, if you all can see me, right, Steve? But then the mix changed, and now it's kind of like this. So we are out in front of it, it's just timing of when we get the bill. Um, and we did definitely reflect it here last year. Obviously, as we hit that plateau and we were coming down in the timing of the two or three months, we kind of over provided uh, but believe me, we took it down more from the first two times what they told us. Okay. All right. Yes. Let me just let me just uh, start off if I can. Um, where am I, Dick? So that's it for for CPI. Linda's asking if she can go forward with the bulkheads. If you're okay with that, it's, it's just a couple points I want to make on bulkheads before she goes line by line. Sure. Great. Okay, so now we're on bulkheads. Which section is that? Nine. Yep. So section nine. But before, uh, and I've gone through this with B and F and everything, and I, in board meetings, and it's certainly it's here in the progress, and it's certainly asked me a bunch of questions. But a couple of things I want to point out for those that are new here. So we normally, at least since I've been here the last several years, we've tried to do three thousand linear feet. The price has gone up substantially over those three years, if not before I got in here, several hundred bucks each year. We did have a big increase last year. I believe it was $100 for the bulkhead differential. This year, it's coming in flat. But a couple of components to that, obviously, is this. So I believe, and Eddie or Adobe jump in, last year we were able to get a price at $355, somewhere in that ballpark, linear foot. Yes. Okay, so we and the board approved it, and, and we we were able to get we 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 uh, we went in we we paid you know ten percent down to get so they could get the materials last year, and we got a price of three fifty five, which helped tremendously. Uh, if we didn't have that, it was clear to me and everybody else it would have been over four fifty to to do it. This year, again, I came to the board. I asked, which was approved by the board, uh, to get the material up front. I don't have it in front of me, but I came forward with 2,000 linear feet at $425. And, and just in the time, and, and Eddie will point it out when he talks too, we started off at 405, but the material was going up so much and everything. We're coming in at $425 a linear foot in this proposed budget, 2,000 linear feet. But here's the reason why not the 3,000. First, the last two years, and especially this last year with COVID, with, with the trying times to get material and even labor, we and the contractor went over the date where we really are comfortable doing bulkheads, which is uh, Memorial Day, the end of May. We went substantially over that, the amount of calls, the amount of uh, just tremendous amount of calls. So we believe the 2000 linear feet, so does the contractor that works better, especially in these times. And let's try, also try to give it some time to see where these materials over, over time, 
maybe starts to stabilize. So that's where we're at on that. The other thing as far as, you know, some people say, well, you were doing 3,000. We just did how many square feet? 450? 450. 450, yeah. So we just did 450. If you remember a couple months ago, I came forward to the board. I called it an emergency. Uh, we, we certainly had a situation with bulkheads. It was probably one of the worst bulkheads we had. That 450 linear feet, and we got a good price for it. What did we pay for that one, A? Uh, 355. So we got we also got that in at 355. So those are all the reasons why we came forward, why I came forward on that. That 450 would have been part of this 2000. So it's not like it's not like we, we have this drastic reduction of linear feet for this proposed budget. All right. Good. All right. So any questions, any more detail on everything? I got Nobi here. He's an expert in this as well as uh, Eddie and Linda. So I have a the quick other, question, John. Sure. So how does a bed fall under the emergency criteria if we are funding and take care of them annually? What what happens that it becomes an emergency? Does yeah, it so fail? It fails. Yeah, so, absolutely. Go ahead, go ahead. So what happens is we, we monitor constant complaints about the bulkheads in different areas. And we actually use the North Star system and kind of keep track of what's going on, the complaints. And we go out and we just constantly keep watching them. The tie rods break, they start leaning out and gradually they're eventually gonna fall in. Um, so we just monitor them until we think they need to be done. And we try to hold on as long as we can. And then we fall for emergency. So also with that, jo Josette, with the 450 that we came forward a couple months ago, which was the general area that happened to be down near the golf course, we had a contractor who had freed up some time also. That was probably one of the worst bulkheads we had. And he gave us a very good price. So in that situation, in, in, you know, in addition to that emergency, is why we asked to go forward. And we would have been working on that now anyway. But yeah, the emergency okay. is, yeah, they're, they're falling in. I get the rebar information. Your Honor, information is that that area has been identified prior to last year. And um, right. it didn't get handled. And uh, it was on this Oh, yeah, and Larry's right on that, Jose. My first year in here, uh, I went down there. We just, I don't know, we just couldn't get it in at that time. But that one was identified several years ago. Yeah, Larry's right. You guys are an amazing group. How you get all you get done in one year blows my mind. But thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you, Jose. So don't don't uh, be despair. Don't don't be so hard on yourself because you guys do uh -huh. a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Josette. Thanks. Okay, bulkheads. Uh, Nobi, why don't you just tell them a little bit? It's not just the contractor. What else you do? What your team does, Eddie? Is other costs in there that then ties to the reserve? Why don't you tell them about that? The saw, the dirt. It's like, I'll, I'll let Nobi talk. Like I said, he's been here longer than I have. He's going on twenty five years. Um, he's been involved in bulkheads since he started. He'll give you a rundown. We do get the complaints. Honestly, we go out and check if we have a sinkhole appears, our cap board comes off, the, the normal things that'll happen during a storm. Uh, but I can let Nobi give you an idea of some of the other things we do where, where we have pipes that go through the bulkhead and the yeah. pipe will fail because you got a, a galvanized culvert pipe that is 40 years old. Well, now it's rusted out, so now you've got a leak around it. So he can explain a little bit in detail just to give you an idea of some of the, the fixes that we come across and have to do. They're not bothering with the coffee pots. She said, I guess it was you that called her on Friday. Yes. Don't bother with them. If anybody wants a cup of coffee, we'll bring them themselves. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that was like, what was that? All right. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, but making coffee, access to water, you want to figure out how to get the water out of the sink in the back. <laughs> yeah. right, right. right. Hey, hey Debbie, Debbie you're, you're unmuted. Me. <laughs> <laughs> all right Nobi, give us some examples of yeah. some of the things that we've done over the years like even pairing the tie rods or repairs right. right so yeah in in the past when we had a bigger crew we used to be able to go out and dig up some of the walls that failed and actually pull the rods back and do some welding and rebolting um as our crews have shrank we get more into higher and outside even to do some of them bigger repairs um We've basically tried to look at the oldest walls from the transite to the aluminum, 
Um, and, and I always get the question, my house is going to fall in the water because the wall's failing. But a lot of people don't understand. Most of the time, you already have another wall behind that existing wall that's fallen in. So you're not going to lose any dirt or anything. But in your mind, you believe that. So there's a lot of things we go out and we have to do a lot of consultant work um, in-house to try to explain just the simple things to everybody out there. So, okay. So the point I'm making on this and what Novi's saying also is you, if you take the contract for the 2,000 linear feet and you try, because people try to do this and then I get calls, if you try to tie that into the reserve and everything in this budget, there's other working here, there's other salaries, there's a percentage of Eddie's, Novi's, a few other people, there's the SOD and all the other work that our, our public works team does in addition to this contract. And there's a lot, and, and trust me, I, I, the bulkheads before I got in here three, four years ago, it kind of stalled and there was a lot of things not going on. Uh, once I found the West, Nobi, trust me, it's a gift. But Nobi does, and Eddie, yeah. and Eddie, yeah. and Eddie yeah. Justin and everybody else, what they yeah, do. His Nobi, experience, you can't buy it. But yeah. they save on these contracts if you go out there to try to get another price. And the relationships that they've built, it's saving us money. And I got the proof to show it. That's all I got, Dick. Okay, well, this is a pretty straightforward one. Okay. Um, and then, so Ryan, I got a question for you. Um, on the um, the dredging line, 75890, um, hmm. we're budgeting 90K for this coming year. Right. Um, but we haven't spent a whole lot of money there <laughs> in the past couple of years. Are you anticipating? I'll put it on the Okay, sorry I put you on mute, but there's a couple things. First of all, it's an excellent question, Brian. It's a couple things, and again, I go back to the board updates that I've given uh, over the last several months, and it's not this needed to be addressed here. And it's, a, it's the question. I'm glad you brought it up because I forgot. We 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 talked about three four years ago when I first came in about the linear feet. We also talked about dredging. We looked at pr probably we said we can do 20 a year, and the dredging for the 20 a year is in this number. Now, the reason, and you're correct, each year we haven't used that money is because, and I'm going to let nobody jump in when I'm done. He has the detail. Over the last three or four years, we've had, and blame it on COVID or whatever, or the people aren't in their offices and they're sitting on somebody's desk. We have not been able to get the permits. Right. And I think the last permits we got, which I think was over a year ago, was for permits from two or three years ago. Correct. 19. So, you know, I'm not going to stop budgeting for it because then that'll be the year that, you know, we get 40 of them. <laughs> so, but that's what it is. And that's where the favorability is. But excellent question. Okay. Thanks, guys. Just wanted yep. to know. No, it's sort of spot on. Yep. Thank you. Any okay. more questions on uh, bulkheads and waterways? Okay. One hey, the top solo. I think Kathleen said the top's a little. Okay. Yeah, but it's 92,000 year to date. So it's the sod, too. The sod, uh, I, I'm sorry, I was just checking to see if the aquatics director was here, but, and I'm going to let Nobi jump in again. It, obviously, the sod is a big number in there, if that's what he was asking, Nobi. Top's a little sod. I'm just going to go out and get Kathleen, but you're in good hands with uh, Nobi. Eddie. <clears throat> yeah, so all the, all the bulkheads that we do, we backfill them, mm -hmm. and then we actually sod everybody that requests sod and um that's where that number comes from we have a golf course yeah. so number but we have none in the proposed budget it's included it's, in the bulk it's included in that working number of the contractor the four the 425 per foot that's it, in that number then what did we spend ninety two thousand on this year year to date ninety two thousand under top soil I think it's never been separated well, from a year to date standpoint. Yeah. So actuals, we record it that way. We just budget at high level. Yeah. Basically. Does that make sense, George? For uh, the actuals, yeah. for the actuals, we're uh, separating it, but really from a budget standpoint, we're just doing it high level. Okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. 
Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dick, uh, BNF, thank you. So we, like I said, Linda, we're on to tab 19, beach parking. Linda will take you through the, the, the P&L and we have Kathleen here to answer all your questions. Linda? Okay, line, line. Um, for uh, first line, the the fee uh, decreased uh, for parking only for, to 315364 the parking weekly it looks like a new fee of twelve thousand one hundred fifty. Proposed parking daily um, decrease or increase to four thousand eight hundred. Okay. Lost the picture. Okay. We lost the picture. Um, so year to date, we're four hundred sixty one thousand dollars through September, which is virtually the year. There's no more parking, and basically. Um, our estimate is less, but our error and our proposal is less. I don't All right, you want because you got that. the detail broken out, right? You're in headlines. Yeah. <laughs> detail All right. broken out. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, so uh, our GL account actually is this, the same. So the actuals are recorded. It's kind of the other way around from what I was saying with bulkheads. From an actual perspective, it's recorded at all in 48597. We wanted to give you guys the breakdown of the different categories. And um, yeah, so 461 is what we have year to date. Our estimate's 535. The difference there is just the lease uh, amortization for the last seven months, seven or eight months after September. Uh, so that additional secrets parking lot revenue still needs to be recognized to get you to your 535 estimate. So what we're doing in the proposed budget is budgeting flat to our estimate. No price increases, keeping the pricing the same, basically the uh, numbers the same on the for last year, how we ended up. Okay, so the same, the same number of uh, passes sold at the same rate equal to last year. Yeah. Um, did, did we give any consideration to uh, not an advocate is, but we any any discussion on raising that rate or we raised it last year. Right? It just it was raised recently. Yeah, I, I believe Dick, we raised it last year. Um, I do have plenty of opinion on this. Um, we did not. We decided on this not to raise it. I can't see why we cannot raise it. But we did raise it last year. And and last year we had the big rebound as far as. Uh, um, you know, people coming out of COVID. Um, I guess what we're saying is that we look at we look at that volume of, of passes sold as being representative of a, a typical summer. I guess. Huh? Right. John, when does that uh, dumpsters lease come due over there? So we just extended both of them last year. I. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I can tell you if your question is when the total lease is done, it's it's like five years. I mean, we just renewed both of them last year, approved by the board. Dumpsters, not secrets. Oh, I'm sorry, dumpsters, dumpsters. Um, I'm not sure if that's every two or three years. It's only it's only it's only like five thousand or seven thousand. It's not a lot of money. What is it? So dumpsters, yeah, I didn't know what this is was either. Um, parking lot. Right. And they 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 park their cars there also. Um, I thought that they just had like one or two spots right near their building, but apparently they have four or four or five cars or whatever. Uh, and they've been paying this this lease for I don't know how long. My point is that that lease is probably going to have to go up. Based on the experience we have with sequence of last year, um, I was just wondering if it's due this year will have an impact in 23. Yeah, I'll I'll check it. Um, but you're right. We we uh, based upon what we learned. Um, you're right. Yes. Okay. 
Keep it right. Keep going. (laughs) Okay. Um, Payroll increased. um, We have the three percent in as other departments, so that increased to thirty three thousand nine hundred and eighty five. Um, over time, we kept the same at 300. Payroll costs increased a little to 6,062. Uniforms um, stayed the same at 300. Contract services stayed the same at 9,800. Cleaning supplies stayed the same at 4,200. And supplies stayed the same at 2,000. Um, equipment stayed the same at 3,000. Uh, the insurance increased to 2,888, and the permit and licenses decreased to 150. Okay. Any questions? Hey, John, real quick, noticing um, under parking lot and repairs and maintenance, basically, uh, you're not you're not uh, funding any of that. Uh, are we okay with the fact that uh, uh, there's no repairs needed or no maintenance needed at the parking lot next year? So you know, and you know what that is. The reason we had numbers in there before was we blacktop the first, the entrance when you go in there, which was a really good idea. Uh, but yeah, we don't have we don't have anything else. There. That place is pretty much gravel, and outside of us doing some type of capital improvement, no, I don't think we need anything. I mean, I think that down the road, down the road, Doug, I think that's something to look at. I mean, the trees and everything, I would certainly, I would not pave it. If you're asking me, I would not pave that uh, lot, but uh, I I think we can do something as far as sprucing up the trees and everything. I didn't, I didn't address this this year and we've really haven't done anything like that, but there's really not much else. Hey, John, this is John O'Connor. How many sisters do we have out there on both the old blow in the regular lot. How many spaces do we have? What, what is it? Three? three? I got it in my head. Let me, let, yeah, I was going to say around 300. Kathleen's saying 250. Let me let me ask uh, Ruth Dan, but I think that's the ballpark. Um, you're right. On the other side, there is a small section that I think, because I've been there, I talked to late and I talked to... Uh, to Gary, I think there's maybe 10, 15, 20 spots on the other side near dumpsters, but I'm going to say 300. But if you want an exact number, I'll get it now. Oh, no, that's fine. 300. Yeah, that's the ballpark, something somewhere, I think. How many passes do we sell each year in total? <laughs> I don't know, 1,700, 3,000. It's, it's a lot. I, do you have the number in there? I don't know how the controllers report. I know it's between 1,500 and yeah. 1,000. Yeah, Steve. 1,700. Yeah, I said 17. Kathleen says 17. Steve says between 1,500 and 2,000. That's the ballpark. But we're selling over five times the amount of passes and spots we had. Yes, sir. Okay. I sincerely hope we never touch that place. Thank you very much. Yep. Good question. Okay, can we go on to uh, Dick? You good with Beach Parking, your team? Yep. Unless there may be more questions. Not hearing any. Go ahead. And aquatics is number fourteen. Steve saying aquatics is tab fourteen. Thank you, Steve. Whenever you're ready, Linda. Okay. Start hey, Linda, with, take us through it. Starting with member dues. Um, the, the member dues increased to two, two, 274,775. Uh, facility rental um, increased to 52,444. Coupons. Um, it looks like there's nothing budgeted for coupons. Because right. oh, that, that's right. Yeah, we did away with that. <laughs> coupons. <laughs> um, daily fees <laughs> have increased to four hundred and eight thousand, and swim classes have decreased to the hundred fifty that hundred fifty thousand. Can, can we talk about um, yes um, fees and usage fees changing usage fees? Good, Kathleen. Mm-hmm. Kathleen. It was my um, recommendation that we make a change in the daily fees for both residents and non-residents. I went to Ruth Ann and also um, 
Julie to confirm when those fees had last been changed. We haven't had an increase in daily fees since 2012. Um, and I think that certainly it, it's time for us to um, increase the daily fees. So I believe we went to $15 non-resident, um, grown up $12 um, non-resident child. We moved from six to $8 on a resident child. We moved from eight to $10 on a resident adult. I'm also proposing that we begin to charge uh, children from the age of one to four. Our policy is right now, you don't pay until you're five. However, um, they are, once they're walking, they're using the pools and they count in our capacity. We've seen that through the COVID year that uh, they have to count in my capacity numbers. However, I don't generate any revenue as well as particularly Mumford's and Swim and Racket. Uh, those facilities will go to capacity very early, sometimes as early as 1030 in the morning. And uh, anyone that comes in that's below the age of five, I generate no revenue. I don't have a history for you as to what that proposed increase would be because we don't capture the data um, but is my firm feeling that we should, in fact, be charging for everybody over the age of one. Yeah. And, and Kathleen, if I could just add something, and Dick, I just want to add something on that. And Kathleen's right. She did come to me. There hasn't been increases down there for seven years. But with that said, the overall budget, and you've seen this in the other amenities, golf, uh, racket sports and whatever, with inflation, with the minimum wage incre increase, with the what I call the mark to market adjustment we needed, that, that's the time. It, it's prudent to increase, reasonably increase prices. So that plus the seven years or whatever the exact number is that Kathleen's saying is certainly, and, and I think these are modest increases It'll be 10, uh, yeah. for aquatics. Okay, 10. Kathleen, yes, sir. Really disagree with part of the children uh, under five. Uh, I understand what you're saying about the COVID, the impact of the numbers, but um, I think it's a really bad idea, and I think that if we need to make up the revenue, that we make up the revenue on the uh, daily non-residents. I think uh, increasing the, the increasing the health hire and the children coming to the non-resident hire make up the revenue. I just, you know. I just think it's a really bad idea to start charging what happened with COVID. This is this is going to be this is not to be received well. And I think that, uh, the fools. Yeah, and, and, and Larry, 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 or Dick, somebody. We're having a very hard time hearing Larry. Uh, yeah, I'm okay. sorry, I, you were muted, right? Yeah, I, I went ahead and unmuted. Yeah, good. I said, good. I, I said, I think this is a really bad idea, starting to charge kids under five. Um, I agree the fees need to go up, but I think if we need to make up the additional revenue, we should be making it up on the non-resident daily rates for adults and the five to 17 year olds. Um, I, I'm reminded of the incident last year, I think it was at Mumford's where we had, we had a large group show up uh, non-residents that created a problem. I, I believe that may have happened twice. No, no, I, I think this is not going to be received well by the community that we start charging children under five years old. I understand why we're looking at it because of the numbers, but COVID is not going to be here forever. And once we start charging under five, I think we got a problem. So, I mean, that's my opinion. I, you know, I, I, I just think it's a terrible idea. And if we need to make up the money, we make it up with the non-resident fees. Well, respectfully, I will um, obviously yield to the board and the board's decision. It's merely my recommendation. And I do have the numbers. Um, changing the non-resident fee does not appreciably increase our revenue because I, when I break out the data, the residents are using the pool. So I, I agree that non-residents should pay a significantly larger fee, but at the end of the day, it doesn't generate 
um, uh, maximum revenue because when you do, it, it's like 4% of people that aren't resident. We can track that now with North Star and it indicates that the vast majority of pool users are homeowners. And it's not my point, again, respectfully, I'll do as the board says, my point wasn't just because of COVID. My point was that they count in the capacity. And also, they, it, it's in other fields. If you take a child to the movies, they pay to go to the movies. If you take them to another venue, then they pay for that venue. I think that it was merely my recommendation, well, and it doesn't really reflect anything in the budget. What about other pools, what about other, pools other places that HR should have? I genuinely don't know. don't know. But at the end of the day, um, as I said, it doesn't. I can't quantify it, so therefore it's not in the numbers for the increase of the revenue. It was merely my recommendation. Uh, this is George. I'm, I'm going to agree with you. I'm not going to repeat everything you said. I think you said it well, but I, I would agree. Again, I'm not speaking on behalf of the NF. Speaking just for myself, that charging cooler uh, under five. I Amy, did you have a question? Yeah, my comment. Um, I, was, I would like to know what the market comparison is of other right. pools charging this age group that provides greater justification for adding this fee. Right. And so, if there's any way to get that information, I think that would be helpful. Um, to the board in deciding, do we want to go, um, support this change or not? Yes, ma'am, I'll get it to you. Thank you. Hey, John, do we have a yes. second? John, this is Frank. Go ahead, Frank. Can you walk me through the um, member dues number, uh, which if I'm reading it correctly, shows it to be flat? And is that achieved by assuming that we're going to have the same number of members at the same rate, or we're going to have a decreased yes. membership at an increased, increased rate? rate right? Steve, we didn't increase the membership, right? We did not increase. No. Right. Flat. Right. So, and I'm just looking in the back, we did not increase the memberships. I don't. Uh, daily fees, not membership. Right. It was only the daily fees. That we increased the memberships, unlike golf uh, here, Kathleen felt to leave it at that. So there was no increase in the membership price. We obviously, with the number being higher, we're, we're hoping to have more members. I guess it was the whole COVID thing. I mean, I, you know, what can you add on that, Kathleen? Well, I mean, I think that. Um we just assumed that there was going to be some greater memberships, particularly too, if you if the daily increase, rates, if right. you increase your day rates, right. that the thought process is, is right. that you would have people that would then yield into a membership right. as opposed to paying a daily rate to go to the pool. Right. Similar to what you, similar to what you heard with racket sports. That that was the approach. Yeah, I just you know, it's it's obviously your call and the board will discuss it at a, at a different time, but it just seems to me that of all of our, by the way, let me just stop a second. Obviously, John, you and Kathleen have done an excellent job both in revenue capture and in expense control that you and I and, and we've talked about, okay? Right, right. Uh, and have cleaned up a lot of uh, what I would call procedural issues and process issues to do that. But it just seems to me that the most predictable revenue stream that we have in any amenity is the memberships. Not that they don't vary, but the most predictable. They're not typically subject to weather and those kind of things. And we know as a fact that because of some statutory increases in wages, that our expenses are going to go up. And when I looked at overall all the amenities, I saw that golf increased their membership by about 3.4% on aggregate. And that kind of corresponds with inflation. And that kind of, to me, indicated that they were protecting against inflation using memberships for that segment of the income. And I don't see it anywhere else. And like I say, achieving the numbers is an operations thing, but I'm looking at it from a risk standpoint because 
when you tell me memberships don't go up, but I look at 28, 25, 15% increases in lessons and in outside, my question is, it seems like the that shifts risk tremendously on those segments of revenue to offset our increased expenses. Okay, so I just want to make sure, and I'm going to answer with the golf and, and the membership, but uh, Frank, net net, are you saying that it, it, it's prudent to increase the membership fee? I would just think, this is philosophical and policy-wise, that if inflation goes up 3.4% on average for the year, that everything should go up 3.4% if you're going to meet our scrolls. Right. And so, I, go ahead, I'm sorry. And when I see that the membership is flat and the other, other revenue segments have dramatic increases, I just look at it in terms of risk in achieving those numbers because, you know, it's the numbers that show the greatest increase are the numbers in my mind that are most uncertain and subject to variability and weather and other things. Okay, so first of all, that, and, and I'm with you, uh, Frank, and, and as I mentioned about inflation, and we did. So here's the thing with the memberships and with the golf. With the golf, it was very clear to me uh, in the golf team, we were able to benchmark with every other golf course that we could pump up the, the membership price. With this, uh, Kathleen felt maybe, you know, not right now with the COVID, we we I don't have a problem, and I'm probably going to go back and rework some numbers for the membership. Here's the thing, and Steve, will, when we ran the numbers, it doesn't come out to a lot of money with the amount of memberships uh, with the increase, but that should not be a reason why we don't increase it. We do believe we get more because obviously the dailies, that was what we were trying to do to get people to, to go to membership, same thing with rackets, and then we take it from there. But I, I, I think it is prudent, and, and I think... We're going to go back and we'll work up some increase based upon the inflation for the memberships. And I'm also going to talk uh, on the racket sports. Uh, I think it was platform or whatever with uh, Debbie. But yes, we, we will rework the numbers. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Frank, do you have a follow up on that, Frank? Uh, you, you, you certainly can do that, John. It's probably not a bad idea. Okay. But when you're looking at uh, when uh, Frank suggests 3.4%. In fact, your daily rates are going up 25 and 33%. Right. Um, and I do believe that will motivate people to go to memberships, which is a good thing. Correct. It's a good right. place to be. Right. Um, so if, if you decide you want to bump memberships up some, I would be, um, I would just give you a little caution there. Wait, I'm sorry. Caution or to do it? Wait, I'm sorry. What? I would, if you just, I would caution you. Uh, in your approach to up, updating uh, membership fees too much. Oh, too much. Okay, so so yes to, so BNF is saying yes to an increase, but caution on how much I increase it. I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, um, I, I think what you, I don't know, if, if, you're, if your dailies are going up so high um, and your membership, your membership only goes up a small amount, how do you, how do you explain that, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I guess I think, that, the board, I think the board's setting is going to be there should be increases, but you know, particularly here with seven years of no increases. No, 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 I'm not disagreeing with the right, He's asking but, you for for what BNF is thinking. Right, right. Just, right. Larry, right. I'm, lo I'm looking, I'm looking, correct. I'm looking for a range, I'm looking for some guidance. I, John, I, I, I'm kind of here, John. Mike. I am always cautious about raising membership rates, no matter the activity, because inevitably what happens, you raise them and you lose members. Historically, golf did that years ago when they kept raising the rates, they kept losing members and people switched to dailies. All right. Your idea about raising the dailies to push people into the membership, I think, is a better approach than raising the membership and having them switch back to dailies. So just be cautious with what you're going to do with the membership. If you are going to raise it, and make sure it's a nominal amount. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So I got, I got, I understand now what the caution is. So, so look, that wasn't the only reason we raised uh, 
the dailies. We, we, we agree. We, we're trying to get them to get the membership, but it was because of inflation. It hasn't been done in seven years. I think what you're all saying as far as guidance is, um, yes, John, look at the membership. You, you should be raising it to some degree. Caution on how much you raise it. So we're looking for a slight increase, which is prudent. Um, Steve will, I'm not even looking at it, but I know Steve's going to say to me, John, it's not a lot of money, but it's just prudent. And, and you know, it, 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 we'll, uh, we're going to rework it with a, an increase. I'm looking to try to see what percentage uh, Kathleen's writing on her pad here. But uh, is that five? Five percent. I know Frank said three and a half. So somewhere in that three and a half, five, Steve and I will run some numbers with Kathleen and uh, we will definitely reflect something like that. The other thing also with, you know, and I understand with aquatics, aquatics has been losing money for a long time. Uh, number, obviously, once we peeled back the onion and took out the beach parking, unbeknownst to me, it was a different number that was getting allocated there than what I had been told all the years. And maybe that was on me. But Steve said I was right. But uh, we're trying and we're trying to do with all the amenities is get that balance. Right. And we're, we're getting there with that. So, yes. If that's what I'm hearing, there's going to be some type of increase, modest between three and a half and five percent, and we'll work that up. Yeah, good. Uh, let's, okay. let's don't get lost in the equation. You guys have done an excellent job. Yeah, I understand, okay. Frank. I, no, and, I agree, Frank. And I want to make that clear. By the way, the other thing you might want to look at for memberships, and and this is my personal thing, um, you might want to look at having a family membership. And I'll use my case for me and Irene that would include two grandchildren. Because when the grandkids come down, that kind of creates an issue. Now that might be an administrative nightmare, but that could drive people over to memberships. Something to look at, not something to do short term, but something to look at to see if it's viable, to see if we can manage it, to see if it would increase revenue in the memberships. All righty, we will definitely talk about that in our follow-up meeting with Aquatics. Um, Kathleen, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. This is Amy Peck. Um, I want to address the um, proposed rate for the one to four. Um, it's a very minimal amount. It's $3. Um, having worked the pool, I know the capacity issue. I was hoping maybe you could address how these children affect your labor numbers and your lifeguard numbers having so many children at the pool. Well, they first off, they're using the facility. So that's a, the portion of, you know, soap, paper towels, things like that. You're more likely to have an incident where I've got to shut the pool down and chemically treat it. Um, but if, for example, if I'm guarding a uh, yacht club, which is historically, it's either uh, adults or, or older people, very few children, I can safely guard that pool with two staff members. Whereas, for example, Mumford's, you have to have a minimum of four lifeguards over there because of the fact that uh, the children typically can't swim, so they have to be highly guarded, which means your guards have to have, you know, be focused and rested and able to control the pool. It's not un unusual to have three sitting lifeguards there on a busy day with one on break ready to rotate in. So, for example, more often than not at the beach club, you're running two, uh, swim and racket. More often than not, you're running two, perhaps three. We're not talking about camp days, but on a consistent basis throughout the latter parts of the summer, July and August, you have to have um, significantly more lifeguards in order to have a safe experience. And, and that obviously affects my cost, too, with no revenue to come to come at it. Um, and then one more point, I noticed the resident rate versus the non-resident rate, um, that across the board is $5 more, except for this one to four-year-old children um, rate, that's only going up too. Had you considered raising that a $5 difference for the non-resident? Um, to be very honest with you, uh, no, I didn't consider that. It was just, it, that's how we presented it. If that's the guidance, then certainly we can take a look at that as well. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I got a, I got a question, I, and it sounds like we're beating a dead horse here, but I just want to make sure I understand. If you look at the daily fees line, uh, you look at the actuals over the uh, 18, 19, 20, 21, they average a little bit over 
200K. And then year to date so far, we've got 293, okay? Um, so you're proposing revenue on that particular line as 408. And from, I, I want to make sure I understand that you believe that that increase, uh, however optimistic it may be, is being driven by the increase in the daily fee rates and, and weekly fee rates and charging um, children between uh, ages one and four. Are there any other drivers that are allowing or kind of influencing that, uh, you know, that $408,000 uh, projection for revenue? What I did, uh, Mr. Parks, is I went through North Star and ran the actuals for each of the outdoor facilities and broke them down in, into what the actual was and then mathematically applied the uh, increase that we had suggested. Uh, the one to four, no, sir, I do not have that in there because we don't collect that data. So it's not a portion of that 408. Um, number one, because it was a policy change, which requires board approval. Number two, I don't have the data. Um, but yes, sir, I do believe that those numbers are factual and that I pulled them from actual through the gate in North Star. Okay. Thanks, Kathleen. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Hey, Kathleen, it's Larry again. Um, listen, uh, I, I just want to make sure everybody understands that you, know, you have done an outstanding job taking over aquatic aquatics director this year. Um, the the revenue increase, um, quite honestly, I have to I attribute to you and your staff collecting the fees that should have been collected over the years. Um, and I, I just want to make sure that you hear from me personally. I think you've done an outstanding job and I appreciate all your hard work last year stepping in like you did uh, to solve a problem that's been existing for years. And uh, you, I just think you've done a great job and I want to thank you for it. Thank you, Larry. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Larry. That was very nice to hear. Uh, Kathleen is a, a very coachable subject matter expert and an excellent leader. Do we lose everybody? I think we've uh, dialogued with things quite a bit here, so we can move on. Okay. Whatever you are. So, Dick, where are we with, with the. I think we just stopped in the beginning. I think we were talking about feed. <laughs> okay, right. you're right. Okay, go ahead, Linda. Okay, we're moving on to the cost of sales. Uh, vending uh, proposes twelve thousand. Merchandise uh, is at five hundred. Moving to expenses, payroll increased to five hundred ten thousand three hundred and eighty three. Payroll cost has decreased to 122905 Employee support remained the same at 500 And training decreased to $1,500. Um, computer supplies has decreased to $1,000. Credit cards increased to $8,500. Uniforms remain the same at $13,000. Contract services remain the same at $14,000. Cleaning supplies decreased to six thousand. <clears throat> Chemicals stayed the same at twenty nine thousand, and gas and oil went up to three thousand. Postage remained the same at one hundred, and supplies increased to twenty seven thousand. Mm -hmm. um, for repairs and maintenance, equipment stayed the same at nine thousand, and for utilities, um, electricity stayed the same at fifty thousand. Uh, gas went up to seventy thousand. Trash removal stayed the same at two thousand four hundred fifty. Telephone remained the same at six thousand eight hundred, and water sewer increased to thirty five thousand eight hundred and seven. For other costs, class instruction decreased to eleven thousand. Insurance increased to forty two thousand two hundred and seventy nine, and permits and license remained the same at four thousand. I have I got a question. Uh, um, uh, my question is the overtime numbers. Why is there no overtime for June and August? 
I think that no, overtime number is an oversight that, that needs to be there. It's historically there. I need it for the start of the season, the end of the season, when we're fully staffed. I just, um, I, I think that was an oversight on uh, my part. Okay, thank Sorry you. about that. Um, hey, Kathleen. I do have a quick uh, question. Uh, another quick question. Um, the uh, the uh, you know, 510K worth of payroll, does that include... Right. Uh, additional staff, or is it de dealing with just salary increases in the statutory raise and the minimum wage, or both? So I think what it deals with is no, no additional staff, the, no additional FTEs, okay. attempting to fill uh, what is required to support all five pools. Portion of it is minimum wage, and then a portion of it, uh, Mr. Parks, is being able to attract the staff to come. Um, so it I have a senior, a very senior light guard. It, let me revert back to my point about Mumford's. I can do a lot with four senior guards exactly. that I can't do with rookie guards that, that may increase that I'd have to move up another <laughs> or another. And I had a senior staff member that told me last year that they were going to serve in Ocean City this year because they could make more money <laughs> serving tables. And it used to be to serve in Ocean City, you had to have a resume. And it was very competitive. And now if you've got a pulse and you can put an apron on and wait a table, then they'll, they'll take you to serve. So I tried to work with John to make it attractive with a step program for veteran guards, guards that have a pool operator license, which were required by law to have at the pools. And then um, the actual, a couple senior leaders within the organization. So it's not an increase in my staff. I do have one full-time position that hasn't been filled where I'm being encouraged by my boss to try to recruit and train a number two. Um, it's just, it's a very, it's a tough task to be able to, to bring somebody in to operate as my right hand. But it's in the budget. But it is, right. yes, sir, it's in it's the in budget. The budget. Right. So Thanks can I just your explanation. Yeah, so Doug, and this is a perfect time for this, and, and I know Marty has asked me for it. Steve's in the process. We, we've done this, Steve's done this every year since JB. Back then we asked for it. He's going to break out and give you a schedule. We're going to ask Josh to put it out there. It answers your question. It gives the breakout in all the different categories that I mentioned in my opening. So you can see how much was uh, allocated to each, and it ties in all the payroll. So we'll give that to Josh. He can put it up there. You can look at the aquatics. And then obviously it has all the amenities and all the uh, departments. So that'll tie everything in for you, Doug, and everybody else. So as he gets, uh, Josh, you out there? Josh? Yeah, sorry, I'm muted. Okay, so Steve's going, to Steve's going to electronically send you the schedule that we do every year, tying in all the all the payroll. I don't know if Marty's on today. I saw yesterday, I, I promised him we would have this as part of the budget process. So if you can, just uh, put this up for for Doug and uh, Dick. Kathleen, we Don Nederos. One quick question for you. Yes, sir. You hear? If you tell, what does a top-notch lifeguard make? Competitively elsewhere or here? <laughs> Maybe so both. My top, my top, my top paid eight years of service could put them on any pool pool operator license. Last year, probably made twelve fifty thirteen dollars an hour. Okay. I also spoke to my colleague at Sea Colony, and he said that last year, uh, board approved in their budget was twelve seventy five. They moved to fifteen the beginning of the summer, and half their pools were closed all summer long. Do you think that's a good number? I mean, if you have little kids that might drown. Should you be paying somebody eighteen dollars an hour? I mean, I don't know if there's a difference in hourly versus a good lawyer. I, I'd I'd like to have the gas or the the power in my pocketbook to attract the senior veteran guards. I'm going to tell you something else that the veteran guards give me. They give me some relief where I can be at another swimming pool. Or I can be addressing a problem in a pump room, a chemical imbalance, because they've got the years of service and they know how to operate the swimming pool and typically only elevate extraordinary um, events to me. 
that's as far as Hey, this is Doug. Just an FYI, is there any concern with this information being public? The information up on the screen right now? Any so concern? It, being public? Yes. Yeah, so Doug, there's no problem with that. We, we've actually put that out there before. There's no names on this schedule. Okay. Uh, I, I got, honestly, I got no problem with it. Steve actually is going to uh, just take you through. We'll do aquatics, which will tie into Doug's question. And then, Dick, obviously, this is BNF. I'm sorry. But I mean, if you want him to go to any other one now or when we do the other areas, uh, uh, Steve will take you through it. Yeah. So this is, Dick, I alluded to this yesterday <clears throat> when we were talking about it. I just touched on the total numbers. So this is the walk schedule that, that John said I've done for the last few years. Just tells you the total salaries for us, where we go from the budget to the budget. Um, so you can see FY22, $4.736 million. Everybody's been <clears throat> referring to the 3% salary increase, and that's on all your full-time uh, people. So that's $112,000. And then you can see for aquatics specifically, we got $5,000 of that increase attributed to that. And then you got your statutory, which is anybody that would have been below 1250 uh, that became effective here in January. That's 13000 for aquatics, $37,000 for the company. And then we had market adjustments um, that we proposed in public works, 35,000, some small numbers in some of the other areas, but primarily public works. And um, <clears throat> the seasonal, you can see the market adjustment is, is all pretty much aquatics. Um, but you can see the offset there as well for the other adjustments where we had a lot of seasonal hours budgeted that Kathleen Sharp and the pencil and basically, you know, determined that we uh, probably had too much, I guess, for lack of a better term, fluff in the budget on the seasonal hours. So we dialed that back. So that was offsetting in that sense. Good. Any questions on that? Any of those numbers for aquatics as you go across the line, left to right? Tying into the five ten that you saw in the budget. So, so yes. how how is your market to market adjustment going to help you with your lifeguards here? What what is it going to actually do? Well, I'm hoping that it's going to attract them to come and work for Ocean Pines. Um, it, it remains to be seen. We'll offer a training class in April, um, as we always do. At that point, we'll try to recruit and recruit heavily. I do have a couple veteran guards that. Um, I lost that will be a huge void because they completed their college uh, degrees and were offered jobs in their field after being with us for eight years. So I I'm hoping that it's going to make us competitive. Um, I mean, we're all talking. I'm in contact with Sea Colony. I'm in contact with uh, Ward Kovac from the Beach Patrol and Assateague. And everybody's just very, very concerned about the employment pool that's going to be available to us for the 2022 season. So it, it's going to take you from, I guess it's different for different levels of lifeguards, but on average, the top guy was making 13 an hour. What would this do for the top guy? In the proposed budget, it takes the lifeguards to uh, $15 an hour and $16 if they hold a pool operator's license with just a, a, a little bit for me, if I've got somebody who has uh, senior leadership capabilities, but that's what the number that drives that. That's what it is for the for us to try to attract the lifeguards. You certainly know this better than me. Um, I, 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 you just, just you have to pay that because you know that's that's what the market's demanding. That's what you're going to have to do. Right. As Don said you don't. You know you, you want you want the better lifeguards. Yeah. Right. Yes. That's why we have Yes. Kathleen, this is Frank. Just a question. Oh. Given the labor situation, given where we're at, you know, rate to market and everything like that, in a worst case scenario, if you can't get employees, are we potentially looking at rolling shutdowns of certain pools? Yeah, what you'll see is you'll probably see something very similar to last year uh, that we would, well, with my boss's help, we would decide perhaps that uh, the sports core starting in July would be open for the morning, the ladies' classes, and 
lap swimming for members until like two. Uh, we would always uh, make the yacht club and the beach club a priority because they service a food and beverage operation. And I think Ralph would tell you that the pool is extremely critical to uh, their success and um, them having a good fiscal season. And then what we we were never ever going to err on the side of safety. So I'm going to then facilitate the pools that I can. And sometimes it's not Mumford's because it requires, you know, an additional amount of guards. But we try to be fair about that because people are very loyal. They're either swimming racket people or they're Mumford's people. But yes, sir, that's what it, that's what will happen if I can't do it. Number one, by law, you have to have X amount of lifeguards per patron. Number two, you're required by law to have a pool operator on site during hours of operation. So the net result of not being able to attract help is that we would have a reduction in services. So we should consider that in the risk category, certainly not a certainty, but in, as a potential risk. Yes, sir. Based on what we're seeing. Yes, sir. Wait, wait, wait. So a risk in the sense, wait, let's just. That we can't staff. Okay, so that you can't staff. So when you say risk, and Frank, I know where you're getting out with this, and I totally get it and agree. What we do see, and obviously here, is that we kind of, we lose some revenue, but then the offset that we don't have the expenses are kind of balanced out. So we didn't, if, if your risk is in a sense when I have to close down, risk to revenue or operational money, we saw this year kind of flat, if, if not in some isolated situations, actually helped us. So is that what you're saying by risk or well, there, there's a risk, profit? There's a risk financially, okay, uh, in terms of net operating profit, but also... You know, if it's 95 degrees outside and somebody walks up to swim and racket and the pool's closed, there's another kind of risk that a community in right. terms of perception. And, and I think that where we certainly don't want to hit the panic button and scare people, but we certainly want to make people aware that given what we're looking at right now, this is a risk. Maybe not a great risk. Right. No, you know, right. but it's a you're risk. Right. You're right. So what we saw this year when she did have to or when we did have to, she was she shifted around. I think she shut sports core or whatever. So that 95 degree day, she kind of had it covered. Agree with everything you're saying. We thought the same, but the, the results. And again, it could be different next year, but the results kind of balanced out. I I, I, I don't have like a, you know, a hedge in there that, you know, I can lose one hundred thousand dollars of 50. Just like, you know, with golf and everything, we, we as I mentioned yesterday, overall, with the revenue projections for, for racket sports, for golf and for aquatics, we kind of do have a hedge in there. You know, if it's bad weather or something, each one of them. So we kind of have it covered there, to your point. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Anybody have any other questions on the aquatics? He's got it broken out there in all the different categories. And you can see how, you know, we went from 478,000 to the 510. Obviously, the big number in the seasonable, there were there were adjustments against that, uh, that lowered it and then the minimum wage. So everything's broken out here for all the different categories. It was a pretty neat schedule. No other questions on that? Okay. I would like to say great job, Kathleen. Nice, nice job. I would be all into getting someone fifteen an hour to save my myself or my children. So sometimes you got to put it in perspective. And Frank, I thought that was a great idea doing a family uh, pass. I know that's more logistics, but because I'm I'm kind of on the line about whether or not to charge young children. It just doesn't seem right. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Heard that, but uh, it doesn't seem right to me either. So I get it. But we need to make money as well. Okay. Take anything else? Not hearing anything. Thanks, okay. guys. Kathleen, Linda. Thank you. Thank you very much on the aquatics. I know I got the police. Let me just check the time. Uh, Eleven oh five. So we kind of said around eleven. The chief, you still there? Yeah, we're we can be over there in just a few minutes, sir. Okay, so Dick, we just need a few minutes and. Uh, We'll do the police, and then I believe Debbie will have the uh, the lunch ready. Okay. Very good. You guys not far to go.
It's raining though. <laughs> it's raining. <laughs> he's got to get in the car and drive around and park. Some belly parking will drop him off. I walked in there one day into the front lobby there. Right. Not that a police lobby should be a warning experience, but it's a pretty cold, sterile kind of. Set of walls and a, and, a, and a little window, you know. The first time I was in there was to pick up these books and say we did it. Yeah. Not that I was in there before. <laughs> well, that's why they added the jail for you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't get it for you. I, I. I was. I wouldn't mind seeing it. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> okay, Dick, are you ready? We we have the chief here in Toppin and uh, Linda. Uh, Give us a few minutes, John. All right, a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Linda will take us through the PL. We have uh chief here in Toppin and uh they're going to take through the budget for the police for one of the safest communities in the United States. Linda. <laughs> okay. Start with revenue. Grants uh, County stayed the same at 475000 Grants other remain the same at 5000 um, Miscellaneous remain the same at 4000 Moving on to expenses. Payroll increased to $1,155,563. Overtime remained the same at sixty-five thousand. Payroll costs decreased to five hundred and seventeen thousand three hundred and ninety-nine. Employee support remained the same at one thousand seven hundred, and training remained the same at six thousand five hundred. Moving on to contract supplies, computer supplies remained the same at five thousand two hundred. Employee ads remain the same at one thousand two hundred and fifty. Equipment rental remain the same at one hundred sixty-five. Uniforms remain the same at twelve thousand. Contract services increased to seventy-three thousand five hundred. Cleaning supplies remain the same at one thousand two hundred. Gas and oil remain the same at twenty-five thousand two hundred and eighty-seven. Postage remain the same at one thousand. Printing remain the same at one thousand. Supplies remain the same at six thousand. Moving on to repairs and maintenance, um, the auto and truck remain the same at fifteen thousand. 
as well as equipment remain the same at 1,000. Moving on to the utilities, um, electricity remain the same at 5,200. Propane remain the same at 200. Removal, uh, trash removal is 550, remain the same. Telephone remains re remain the same at 11,800. And water and sewer remain the same at 1,012. Dues and subscriptions remain the same at 250. Insurance decreased to 29,411. And permits and licenses remain the same at 100. I got I got a question. Um, at, at some point, I believe we we uh, uh, whether it's going to be a requirement or just a, a prudent decision to use body cams. Uh, do we have uh, an, an allocation in our capital funding, or should we start thinking about uh, where we want to be with regard to body cam so we can be prepared for that expense when it comes up? Yeah. So Doug, and they're actually going to get into that. Uh... Yeah, so Mr. Parks, uh, last year when we discussed it. We knew it was coming. We didn't know when it was coming because of legislative you know, the police reform. We've already been notified that the police reform act is in fact going to affect us. We do fall under that regulation. Lieutenant Toppin's operation has been to coordinate with the other agencies, with the Sheriff's Department, Ocean City PD. Uh, the, the contracts that we're looking at right now, we are going to be mandated to have that next year. However, we're prepared to go ahead and start that process now. Um, with talking with Steve, with the contract budgets and everything that the other agencies to scale it down to our number of personnel, we are looking at approximately $150,000 for the project, which includes the body cams, the uh, charging stations that each camera has to have for downloading its information, the storage of that information, um, it also includes the capability of a prosecutor's office to be able to download whatever information that we have on the cloud. The software that it includes will include prosecution, uh, the different arrangements and the compatibility that if we have a call and one of my officers has a deputy come assist them or they're assisting a the deputy on a call, all these units are compatible. Uh, we're trying to stay away from them having one system and us having another, and then you have to have multiple software. So with the coordination that uh, Lieutenant Toppin has done with the company to, for us to all stay compatible, the contract that they're offering us is the best deal that we've come up with. So we estimated around the $30,000 um, last year when we had this discussion with this complete project being approximately 150000 and it's a five-year contract, which puts us in that $30,000 a year process. Um, the only thing that we did not allow for, which we still have to discuss with, is when the officer has to put a body cam on, that has to download to a cell phone. And the cell phone is what programs your camera for each officer. So when the officer comes in, puts the body cam on. Um, so we have legalization issues as far as asking the officers to put on apps onto their personal phone. So the part that we were not prepared for was to issue departmental phones for these programs, for each, for the cameras. Um, we've worked out with Verizon that Verizon will donate to public service, to EMS and police. They will donate the phones. However, we have to connect the service. So for our department, it would be like adding uh, 13, I believe it's between 13 and 15 actual cell phones to our bill, to our phone bill budget, which as of right now is not included in this. And, and the plan would be to allocate all the body cams at the same time, not phase them in, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. So then just to add from an accounting standpoint, Doug and, and everybody out there, I think when we were looking at it originally last year, um, we had talked about a new capital contribution for this, but after looking at the contract and such that we're latching onto here, 
we don't essentially don't own the equipment. We are renting the equipment, software, et cetera. So it's really just a contractual number. So if you look at the detail page, there's a body cam contract, Axum Enterprise, that we have built in $10,000. And that makes the assumption that January 1st of next year is when we start that contract. So so that would preclude us from making a capital purchase of you know the amount for 15 body cameras? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks. And that also that also carries over with all the maintenance. Everything is on on axons. They do all the replacement. If there's damage to a camera, it's an automatic displacement uh, or a replacement, I should say, for for each individual unit. Um, they they are also responsible for any of any of the legalization as far as having to testify on on things like that. That's normally going to be dumped on us. Now we're presenting this project of a total of one hundred and fifty thousand over five years for third for thirty thousand a year. That's on the assumption of right now that legislation has mandated us to fall under the Police Reform Act of having these, but they've not issued any assistance for funding as far as grants or reimbursements or anything like that. Now, that's that's we're hoping and we have our names on the list as every other agency that if that becomes available, we will definitely apply for it and hope that we get some of that back. But we're having to do the mandate under the assumption that we have no financial assistance. And Chief, one more question. Are there any concerns on your part with regard to lead time to get this equipment and get it uh, up and running? Or it's just, uh, you know, you're comfortable with whatever you're talking to the vendor already? We, with talking with the vendors online uh, and by video conference, just like we're doing right now, Lieutenant Toppin's project is, they're, they're suggesting is approximately a six to eight month to receive it, be right. trained on it, and have at least two months of experimenting with it before we declare that we're operational to okay. the state. All right, good. Thank you. Yes, sir. And you're targeting January January of next year to be up with this? To 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 be able to put the check mark in our box. Our mandatory is 23, 24 uh, to say that we are in compliance with legislation. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to check the box in January of next year to say we're up and running. Yeah, just to clarify, I, I just heard this is George. I'm sorry. Uh, from uh, Doug that uh, we're buying the cameras and the 150,000 or 30,000 a year is for all the software and content. Did I hear that? I hear that. Mm -hmm. No, the, the, we're buying the cameras as part of the project. They will replace them every two and a half years or as needed. We get automatic upgrades yes. and things like that. But at the end of this five years, that will be gone and we will have to renegotiate another contract. Okay, so it's, only, it's a lease. Yeah. Basically, you're leasing the equipment. Well, one quick question. I know, Chief, you talked before when we first started that there were cameras that were maybe out of service at times because they need for they need them for uh evidence or whatever, but this contract would cover all that if a camera's out of service for evidence and then they give us another camera. They're warranted, they're warranted also. Yeah, they're, they are warrant. the cameras themselves are warranty, so they do an automatic replacement on them at no cost to us. And the, the question that we had before about having to store a camera in evidence has all been eliminated by the software program that goes with this. When an officer comes off the street at the end of the day, when he plugs it in to charge it, it actually uploads that information to a program called evidence.com, which is federally secured. Uh, so we don't have to worry about putting that camera in an evidence room and holding it for six months waiting for court. The courts can then, the prosecutor's office can, we, when we write a report, we will tell them that there's video footage for that case. They have a log on opportunity and they can go look at a 20 minute video and say they want six minutes of it and pull it. So we don't have the expense of having to be down a camera. We don't have the expense of having to hire another person just to download camera video footage case files that have to be mailed. Um, so we, we're losing all the expense there of having to have in-house storage, which our IT has already explained to us that that would be a very expensive venture for us to have to do that. One quick question, deviate from the camera for, for just a minute here, as long as I'm on. 
Uh, the, uh, gas and oil, you have the same, uh, which is that a good number? Are you comfortable with that? We, we have been comfortable with it, uh, mainly just because of the, the decrease in manpower. Um, we don't have as many officers on the road. Actually, we are losing an officer as of January the 16th. So we have limited the amount of cars and stuff that are actually on the road, putting the miles on each each independent. So by not increasing the manpower to be on the road, we're not increasing the the gas and maintenance and things for for the usage of those vehicles. They've been doubling up too. They've been doubling up. Yeah, and some some of our officers have been doubling up just uh, because of safety issues, um, because of the way things are right now. I just want to make sure we're comfortable with that number. Okay. Thanks, sir. Are you replacing the the officer that you're losing in January 16? This is a vet. Are you are you replacing? Oh, I'm sorry. We we have we have one officer that returned. Um, the officer had 19 years here. Uh, left last April. Um, there was a death in the family. He was taking over a, a business. So the officer that I'm losing in January, um, I'm re that officer is returning. So I'm actually staying the same, but I'm still one short. Um, police recruiting and retention is at its all time lowest. It's not an Ocean Pines issue. It's an everywhere issue. Ocean City right now is recruiting everywhere from Penn State to Richmond, Virginia. Uh, just to try to get officers. The sheriff's department right now is like eight officers short. Um, so we we are staying where we right staying level with losing the one that we, we're losing, and we are losing this one to the Worcester County Sheriff's Office. Um, I have a question regarding um, the training cost. Is it going to increase because of the body cams? No, uh, the contract with the body cams comes with their training and everything included as as part of their package uh, with the company and finance package. They will come here, do the installation. They will do the in-service training. On our training costs, we're staying the same as we are uh, because of the cost of the academy. Um, if we were to put an officer, the officer that I'm losing right now, I can't even replace that officer. There's not an academy class available until July, which would mean that officer would go to the academy from July till December, graduate in December, two months of on the road training with a training officer such as Lieutenant Toppin or one of our field training officers. So for the officer that I'm losing right now, that training takes that many weeks um, that I would not have an officer on the road in his place until February. Okay. Um, but it, but as far as the other training, because of COVID, a lot of our training has the state normally requires each officer has to have a certain amount of hours of in-service training every year to retain certification. A lot of that has become video and online, um, which saves us some money as far as having to send them to Baltimore or Sykesville for a week at a time and things like that. So a lot of that's being done. We've also, Lieutenant uh, Chauf, and Lieutenant Toppin have issued uh, classes for, for instructors. So we now have some of our own instructors. So instead of sending someone away for, for school, we actually can have, an, just like this, have an in-house online session in our training facility with our own instructors. Great, thank you. So that's why we're staying the same. Hey guys, question regarding the uh, grant from the county. That thing's been static for years. Is there any way to negotiate a, a, a increase in the grant from the county, given the expenses going up? And there's there's been talk about it before. Um, as police chiefs and sheriffs, uh, it's kind of a tennis ball thing. Yes, we could demand more money if we went back and documented every time we go out and assist them. However, if you look at it on the other side, deputies are more apt to come in and assist us than it is for us to go out and assist them. So if we try to ask them for more money, we don't want to put them in the position where they start charging us 
for assistance either. <laughs> gotcha. So okay. it, it kind of, that's why it kind of stays level and stays balanced the way it is. Um, they come in and help us. Um, they have issues. They don't have coverage, so we go out and, and help them. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Two stun and rusting. Do you have any kind of COVID problems where you might have to lose three or four officers that they have to quarantine or any of that stuff? As of right now, we have not. Knock on wood. Um, Throw it off, that's, right? That's that's been yeah. That's been a uh, that's been a, a concern with ours as far as protection. Um, as far as the officers use the same car that they use all the time, limited access for any group efforts in, in the building amongst themselves. Our, our concern is if an officer is involved in something else at home and a family member right. becomes uh, positive tested, I could lose a third of my department for 10 days, which is also the assistance with the sheriff's office and things like that, that we can go and tell them, hey, I've got two officers that are on COVID leave until a negative results and the sheriff's department knows we're down manpower and will assist us. So far, we have had no issues with being down officers because of COVID. Our concern, again, is where chances are we would not lose one. If we have an officer that has an issue, three of us that work that shift would become an issue. Pardon me? Are they all vaccinated? The, no, my whole department's not vaccinated. So I would I would estimate right now we're probably at 50-50. We're probably at 50-50 as far as the ones that are and the ones that are not. So a question on, on, on payroll. So um, is, is the payroll increase the standard merit pool or is there some market activity in this payroll increase at that schedule the schedule so the, the schedule i'm sorry who asked that question the schedule we just sent to all of you it goes line by line um we did aquatics it's all it's oh, all uh, it's all mark um adjustment three percent three percent and then he's got another adjustment what's the 16 last column that's uh just a movement between dispatchers and um and such and that was basically that, done with in-house uh, Steve's adjustment for in-house we had a dispatcher that just retired January 1 that was making a higher salary um, we are actually using the the new hiree is is being hired at a lower salary and we are using that adjustments in difference to balance out the remaining three dispatchers that we have to bring them competitive um, again um, Wisher County 911 Center is, is down six dispatchers. Ocean City was picking up dispatchers. So by doing the adjustments we did within losing a higher paying employee and hiring a lower paying employee and being able to adjust that to the middle, we are right now. I think we've decided right now that we are within reach of competitive for any of the other dispatchers. Right. So it sounds like with your dispatch adjustment and with your with your police reports, it sounds like you think you're at you think you're at market level. We're we're at market level, even at payroll. Um, we have we have discussed uh, we as far as pay salary hourly salary, we're comfortable with where we are. Uh, again, by not being a municipality, we lose benefits that the other departments issue, uh, as far as pension, as far as take home cars and things like that we're, that's that's where we lose them the officers too um for the, for the different things but as far as payroll with the with the adjustments that that steve and i and has suggested and i has already marketed we're 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 within range okay all right thank you okay any other police questions <coughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. That is it for this morning. I, I, I'm sure your food is there. I saw Debbie going over. Um, we have the fire department coming in at one o'clock. And that would be it for today.
Uh, Dick, if, if, any, if any so. Chance, any chance they might get here a little earlier? I, I will reach out to them. Um, what time is it now? 12? 11. We also have food and beverage. 11.30? Food and beverage. We got, we got 12.30 food and beverage, right? Yeah, food and yeah. beverage. So, so we, we could do food and beverage uh, before the fire department gets here. That's what we're going to do. Um, you only want to try to take half an hour for food. That's fine. Steve then will go at 12. Let me see if I can get the, ch the chief to come. So let's, let's, let's shoot for Steve at uh, 12.15. I'm sorry, what time? 12.15 for food and beverage. Okay, 1215. Okay, okay. So let me see if I can uh, let me see if I can get the chief in here earlier. I'll ask him for 1230, Dick. Is that what you want? That's good. You said yeah? Yeah, food and beverage should be pretty quick. Yeah, and we've gone through the food and beverage already. And okay, let me see if I can get him. Okay, Dick, we're ready here. We just did a little debriefing and went through the, uh, the process. Uh, but uh, Dave, Steve, and Harvey are here. Um, Harvey, everybody knows Dave and Steve. Harvey is the... I'm the EMS captain responsible for the career to staff. And uh, Harvey uh, had a lot of input on this budget for Dave and Steve, specifically the areas that obviously have the increases. So with that said, um, I'm going to hand off to Dave. Okay. And uh, Dave knows the drill. He's going to start with revenue. Okay. And the chief and I are going to go back and forth when we get down to the compensation and related costs for the career staff. We'll turn it over to Harvey. And if you have any questions, just pipe up whenever whenever you want to. Member expenses include things. Yeah, so start with revenue first, John. Yeah, oh, sure. yeah, yeah, start with the revenue and then you work your way down to the expenses. You cover it. Yeah. Okay. All right, the revenue uh, on the uh, left-hand side is the uh, EMS billing, which is the uh, billing for ALS services. And this also correlates down to the category on the right side, uh, which is category 4804, which is the billing contract. The EMS billing is the, is the amount that we get for EMS services minus what we pay the billing company, which is again down there. You'll see 38,000 we pay to the billing company and our revenue uh, this past year was 475 and expected to be somewhere around there. County fire is the 300,000. That's what we get from Worcester County for hey, fire. Hey Dave, can you, hold, can you hold for a minute? Yeah. So if I understand, and I don't want to jump ahead, but if I understand, you're looking to add additional EMS people to this budget. Is that correct? Harvey? Yes, sir. All right. So if you're adding additional EMS to this budget, why is there no change in the EMS billing? From last the year? EMS... The EMS billing that we are able to collect are transports only. So if we transport somebody to Atlantic General Hospital or Peninsula Regional Medical Center, we bill those folks. Well, I understand that, but if you're increasing the number of EMS headcount, doesn't that indicate that there would be more transports? We can't predict. Yes and no. The, so the short answer to your question is, I don't know why I have this feedback. All of our people are cross-trained, fire and EMS. Um, so we also staff the fire engine in periods of low manpower. And Harvey, one second. Hey, Josh, Josh, can you hear me? Can you help us out? There's some feedback. Yeah, that's oh, Larry's that. mic. That's Larry's <laughs> mic. Larry, if you could mute when you're not talking, that will get rid of it. Thank you. All right, Mr. Perrin, I'm sorry. So we're cross-trained. So in addition to staffing the ambulance for EMS calls, we staff the fire equipment for fire calls as well. So that's part of our manpower issue that we're having, which is uh, which is globally a problem with all companies. Um, the other thing, too, we have a significant number of EMS responses where we don't transport the, the people. In 2021, we had 458 calls with patient contact where the patient didn't go to the hospital. They were not transported. So we cannot bill them. We cannot build their insurance if they were not transported to the hospital. So that happened 458 times. We still have to respond with the crew 
They may or may not have a medical problem. Um, we may do something to treat them and leave them at home if that's what they wish. Uh, many, many times it's folks that need help up or, or, or you know, need some help at home. Um, some of those numbers have increased. Our, our basic call volume has slowly crept up over the years, um, but we are, we are using an estimate for our billing revenue that kind of that kind of stays the same, um, and we can't guarantee it's going to go up. So that's why we're at the same. No, I, I, I understand all that, but the <clears throat> then I don't understand why we're looking for additional headcount. And if you're nothing, no, nothing has changed uh, organically regarding your calls. Um, if you're, it only makes sense to me that if you are adding more headcount to do more calls, then the percentage of uh, calls that would generate EMS billing should go up. Otherwise, I don't understand why we need additional people. We because can't we predict that, sir. We cannot predict that these calls are going to go up. Um, as we've spoke about several times, the volunteers are just not here, especially during the daytime, but that's becoming more and more at night right now because of our demographics. So it's hard for us to say that, yes, that 475 is going to go up to 600. There's no way we can predict that. Currently, we have three paramedics, uh, paramedic firefighters on duty 24 hours a day. The fourth paramedic firefighter is 12 hours a day. Therefore, we're relying on a, a volunteers to cover that driving position for the fourth paramedic if this is a second call. We can no longer rely on that because of our manpower shortages. Therefore, the two positions that are being added equate to four people 24-7. That's what it is. It's not related to the number of calls. Harvey, do I have that right? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Does that so, so answer your question, Mr. Perron? I mean, that's an explanation. I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure um, that I accept it, but that's okay. Okay. Well, in addition to that, sir, in addition to that, um, you know, additional manpower on our part, if you look at the average patient we have, we are in Ocean Pines. Um, back when I started working here and started volunteering here, patients probably weighed an average of 200 pounds. Now they weigh an average of 275 pounds. We have more equipment. It's heavier. It requires more manpower for us to do things. Um, so that's that's part of the equation too. And we, we run a significant amount of second EMS responses um, while the first crew is out or there was a fire last week. So part of the crew went on a fire in a neighboring town, which is our responsibility, which left the second crew to provide uh, primary EMS service for Ocean Pines. So, we, so that's why the, the additional people are being requested. Chief, can you answer one question to help me go on? How many EMS runs did you make last year? We had a total of um, 1,920 EMS responses last year. Out of those, only, uh, or well, actually 1,160 were transports either to Atlantic General or Tidal Health. Uh, the rest of those were those 458 that I talked about. And it, plus, we have the, the, the balance is EMS, an EMS unit must respond on every single fire response per okay. county power. And uh, second thing, do you have the number of responses that you had to make while one crew was out transporting or dealing with a fire situation? I believe the number that Steve had in the had in the last meeting was about 280. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure of that specific number, but it's about 280. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. We'll let the two of hand up for you. Uh, Frank asked the question I was gonna ask. So oh, thank you, Frank. Are we ready to move on? We're ready to, John, are we ready to? Okay. 
you don't think you, you'll be able to improve on the 475. What makes you think it will be 475 and not to be 80? What's good now? I couldn't understand what it was. So I believe you asked if, if 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 our 475 prediction would go up or how we'd improve on that. Is that your question? Yes. Well, if, if you can't predict it going up because you don't know, and I understand that, what makes you think it's going to stay the same? Why not? Go up? It's kind of it's kind of a, a year to year. It's you know sometimes the same number of transports, but what we what we normally do is say, okay, if we build for and collected. If, excuse me, we built for a lot more, but we collected 475 last year. Let's kind of stay the same and not project it's going to be higher because we don't know it's going to be higher. So if we project the same flat and we, we do better, then we do better. But, you know, the, the way things are going, the reimbursements are not much better. So, so Josh, could you help me out? There's a lot of uh, feedback here. I could see one of the one of the initials has a blue circle. I don't think they muted their... Uh, the line, can you see it? Um, looking right now, the only unmuted are the boardroom you, you, and you see, the You see the one with the blue, okay. Is that one muted? That cell looks like it. I mean, there's a dog barking. Then, oh, I got it. Yeah, you see it? Yep, that's They're it. Thank, yep, you, you got it. Thank you very much. Right, I'm sorry, and whoever, I'm sorry, who I didn't know who asked that last question. And I can, I have a fiscal year report for, Fiscal year 21, um, we projected 475 we would collect, and we actually collected 465, 194. So we were actually, uh, we budgeted higher than we actually collected. So, so let me ask this question. Have you hired any of these people at this point? So what we did this, this year due to low manpower, we have, as I explained in the last meeting, uh, sir, I don't believe you were here. Um, that this particular year that is is uh, much shorter as far as manpower in all the companies, many of our part-time folks that work for us to fill in that fourth day shift that Dave was talking about work in Ocean City. Well, Ocean City has now grabbed a hold of them and, and, and made a holdover policy and a callback policy. They can be held over for 24 hours. They can be called back at any time to come to work and they don't have a choice. So we don't have those folks working for us. So we took two of our part-time people that were working for us and put them into full-time positions. That did two things for us. Number one, that filled a whole bunch of holes, which we're filling right now, and we're still struggling with that. But that let those people know that they're going to get their full-time hours here at Ocean Pines. And that helps cover that fourth shift during the day. Instead of having to use overtime pay. The problem I have is to understand this is a gigantic ask. And we're looking at 30 dollar assessment increase per household for this. And on top of that, you know, we're going to bump up the capital contribution, which is going to be another two and a half dollars per household. We're looking at so over two dollar increase over last fire department. That's a huge increase. I think the number John has factored in here with everything else is a thirty-eight dollar increase. Larry, let me let me make a comment. Steve already told you that there were over two hundred calls that were yeah. second calls, right? Isn't that the number, Steve? About 280. Uh, 280. Yes. About 280. If, in fact, that second call has a provider only, it requires having a driver at least. If we can't get a driver out of Ocean Pines, that means that another ambulance from Berlin or Shawl has to respond. If that is the case, there's a good 10 minute delay in their response time. If not we, more. Or more, which is a life threatening situation. You understand that. So our purpose is simply to make sure that we can cover the two calls, cover a fire with a call, et cetera. And also what this does 
is it reduces the overtime when we have to bring other people in to fill shifts. So uh, I, I got it. Then I, I'd like to see, I would like to see the overtime numbers. I'd like to see more detail here in regard to uh, what your salaries are. <clears throat> I mean, this because this that. is such a large. Ask, we've already provided. We've already provided that. Yeah, you, yeah I, had, I don't have it here. So, I, so you I got think, it. You got it somewhere that we can send it to. We want to send it to my buddy Sal. We'll just send it to him. He's the one asking for it. So well, no, I think this is something that needs to go to the whole board. We need to see. So, uh, where we're at. We can break I mean, down again. This is overtime such a only huge for you. Ask. If you want I that, understand a number a of overtime issue. only. This is a big. This is yeah, a big dollar. Big that's what I don't understand, sir. Um, you want to break that piece? Why there's being we can, what we paid out safety should be the this this top priority. Break that and what we paid over time. It worries me. Conversations going on. One at a time, guys. Too many conversations going on. One at a time. I I got a comment. So so while I understand the concern regarding uh, an increase on the expense side. Uh, in the previous meeting we had to discuss all this, one of the things that came across loud and clear was from the community survey that cited safety as a very, very important aspect of living in Ocean Pines. Um, to, to the point that if we have to add um, staff in order to maintain a certain level of safety, uh, I don't have a problem with that. I don't see the correlation between adding staff and automatically worrying about an increase in the EMS billing. Uh, to me, staff doesn't initiate uh, EMS billing like a sales call. EMS billing is initiated by people in medical distress. So obviously that's unpredictable. Certainly you can use historical data to come up with an estimate, but at the same time, uh, yes, it, I'll, I'll agree with Larry in the sense that it's a big ask, but I don't have the same concerns that uh, we uh, th that it seems to be that there's a concern that we're adding staff. I believe we should add staff based on the operational analysis that the folks uh, at the fire department have done in order to maintain that very important aspect of safety within Ocean Pines that resonates very loudly with our community. I, Doug, I don't think anybody disagrees that safety is is a is the most important issue here, and we understand this could be a safety issue, but. I think we need to have more detail here uh, regarding what the costs are salary wise, uh, benefit wise uh, for the department. And I got to tell you, until I see more detailed information versus what we have here is just a summary number, uh, I'm not going to be satisfied. I, I I need to see more. You have to censor. I've heard it to the old one. Go for it. No, no, I'm just. I'm Oh. Okay, so we will send to the whole board, Larry, as requested, the salary information. John, that, that, that should include all the benefit information, too. Salaries and benefits. Yeah, you have that information. We provide yeah, it. Steve's got to get it done. <clears throat> so um, you're going through the budget pages <clears throat> right now. Are, are you basically kind of repeating what? You did last session, or is there anything new that? No, we're repeating no. every. We're repeating exactly what we did at the last session. All right. So let me just kind of summarize things here. Um, <clears throat> I say that there's some people on the call that didn't participate in the last session, which is right. Sorry, but um, so I guess I'll, I'll reserve my comments. I'll, I'll let you go through your line by line. But I have kind of summary I want to bring up with, with maybe some conclusions. So I'll let you go ahead. So, Dave, can I just go? Yes, yeah, okay. okay, let me just jump in on procedure, okay? And so because it what, what the point that was just made. So what happened was for everybody else, because this is not just for BNF, this is for the entire community and whoever comes in on this. So what I did was this came in kind of at the end. I had not updated, none of us had updated BNF. So I did ask the fire department, whether it was a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, to come in on the BNF meeting to give BNF a heads up. The whole entire time, the intention is and the process is for this to be done today. It might be repetit repetitious because of what happened, but it needs to be done today because this isn't just for BNF. This is for everybody else. That's fine. Proceed. Go ahead. I just want to make sure everybody else understood that. Okay, Dave. 
Okay. That was easy. County fire. County fire is the amount of money we get from the county for fire services. Uh, county EMS is, again, the money that we get from the county for EMS services. EMS is uh, 508 money, which is equipment funds that we get from the state. And then there's a little bit of interest. So I'm going to jump back to the operating expense general. Stay with the income a minute. Is this John O'Connor? Uh, where is your fundraiser? Uh, uh, the raffle for the Jeep or whatever other fundraising you have? Where is that? In the okay. okay, the fundraising that we earned this year was we uh, let's see 121 120 121 thousand, and that came from eighty thousand for the mail out that we did and and uh, i think it was ten thousand for the sign program and then the remainder came from the differential uh with paying off the truck so it was a total of 100, 121 i think he's asking where it is on here oh it's not on here that's what i'm that's, i think that's what he's asking no it's not on here and the reason it's not on there is because it goes into the apparatus reserve account for our 50% that the state, that the department is responsible for, for purchasing apparatus. Ocean Pines, a memorandum of agreement says Ocean Pines Association pays 50% for the apparatus and the department pays the other 50%. And we've been working with Doug Parks on this. All right, so all your, all of your fundraising money goes into your reserve for apparatus, right? That, that is correct. correct. That is correct. All right. And and um, so you have apparatus uh, line item on here for um, 151, and you have capital purchases 45. So That's is the correct. share for apparatus plus other capital purchases? Yes, you want to talk about yeah, that, that's purchases? correct. The 4706 that you see under capital equipment, what that number is, is we have our SCBA, our breathing bottles, uh, and air packs that do expire, and this is to replace those. They can only be hydro tested a certain amount of years, and then they have to be replaced. That equipment alone, you're looking over a thousand dollars per bottle, and the entire pack uh, is right around. Probably close to about thirty-five yeah, to four. I'm just, to trying, I'm just trying to understand the obligation of Ocean Pines. So Ocean Pines yeah. clearly pays fifty percent of a, a new apparatus purchase. That's correct. And they pay fifty percent of some other capital purchases as well. No. Well, those capital purchases are they, they're paying for. Who? Yeah. These. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They. Yeah. The forty-five thousand is in addition to what the apparatus replacement is. The memorandum of agreement only covers apparatus replacement. It does not cover other capital capital purchases, and it does not cover infrastructure. So they're not contributing to that. We are okay. So the other cap. If, if you buy a computer, is a capital purchase. Is it from Pines pay that or is it a cost yet? We pay that. We, the operating we pay that out of the operating costs. So I, I guess my, my, I know I, the, the apparatus is pretty easy to understand, but I don't understand the other 45. And, and what that, what else that would be? Could it be 60, 70? You know, what, what else could it be? I'm not sure I understand this question. 47 notes. I thought you explained it. 47. He wants to know what the 45,000 on the left side is. Yeah, that, I mean, that's exactly what it is. What I just explained, the the air bottles, the replacement of equipment that it, just years out that we have to replace. Um, we Non-truck, non-ambulance. Non-truck, non-ambulance, right. Capital equipment, SCBA stuff. Uh, we don't, radios, that's all in a different, but that's mainly our gas meters that we have to have to <clears throat> extinguish the gas. That's all in with this capital stuff. So I, I simplistically, think Chief, simplistically, the capital consists of the fire engine to get you there and the equipment that people no, wear right. to protect themselves and test. It's capital. Is that correct? E, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, there's a separate, yes, there's yes, a separate yes. line item. Uh, Mr. Daly, there's a separate line item for turnout gear. And we'll get to that uh, in a second when we start going over actually operating expenses. 
I understand, but some of the stuff that they have to wear to address yes. a fire or EMS is that's pretty doggone expensive. That's correct. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so I have one more question. Yeah, one thing, uh, we have another question here. I have a question. So um, I know Doug has recalculated our contribution to the apparatus reserve at 151000 and you guys just got done telling us that you're going to contribute 121,000. That's not a 50-50 no, split. That's not that is not what I said. That's not what we said. What I said was our fundraising. The question was how much did we derive from fundraising? I said that we derived 121,000. What we did the last year was 131,000. This coming budget is 151. The, the previous budget was 131. You contributed 131. We contributed 121 from fundraising and took 10,000 out of savings for a total of 131, which equates to both of us contributing 131. The new budget that we are proposing is 151. Why is it 151? Because the industry costs for equipment go up every year. And every year we get a list of the average industry costs for every piece of equipment that we have. The, we then decide, then we then divide that into the amount of years left on that particular purchase before we make it. And then we summate that into what this coming year is 151 versus the past year was 131. Okay. David, I understand all that. What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get to is the last year you supplemented the reserve, the, the apparatus reserve from your savings account. If I understand what you're saying, you're probably looking to do that again this year, another 30000 from that savings account? Is that it, will it will depend on how much we make in fundraising. Back when we were, back when we were raffling houses, we made a lot more money, but we can't afford any more to buy the land, to put a house on it, um, and to make a profit. Therefore, we went to- I understand to all that, Dave. That's not my question. Okay. So my question is, whatever the contribution you're making from your fundraising, let's yeah. just say, let's say it's $130,000, okay? Okay. We're contributing $151,000. That's a $21,000 difference between our contribution and your contribution. That's correct. If, if you handle it the same way as you handled it last year, that's $21,000 will be coming out of your savings account. That's correct. Okay. My question, so the concern I have is that savings account, where is that coming from? And is Ocean Pines part of the money we're giving as part of our MOU? Does it contribute to that savings account? And in essence, Ocean Pines is contributing more than the 50% because we're contributing money that is ending up in that savings account. No, that's not true. We have a specific savings, we have a specific apparatus replacement account that only is the apparatus replacement account. And the way we handle it is you give us the apparatus replacement money based on a monthly basis. I think last year it was 10,900. We deposited that specifically in the apparatus replacement account. Our fundraising is based on calendar year. And so at the end of the calendar year, we establish how much we've made in fundraising, which by the way, we just did. We put that 121 into the apparatus replacement account and we took 10,000 out of our savings, which we've been trying to save for things like a new building, et cetera, et cetera. And so we put that in the additional 10,000 into apparatus replacement. That is not, that has nothing to do with the operational, uh, the operational funding with the exception of the line item. Dave, Dave, I understand all of that. But the, the, the point is, where is the money coming from that is going into the savings account? 
the money going into the savings account used to come from the houses. It used to come from the houses. We used to be able to make a profit well above what it would cost us. For, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Please. Well above what it co would cost for apparatus. That has completely flipped. Apparatus now, apparatus, uh, an engine is $650,000 and maybe even more. We have, as of the last two years, we've not been able to make enough in fundraising to cover the one, the 50 percent. Therefore, we've reached back into our own savings, which we've accumulated again during the good years. And so we are now into that. We're talking about how we can fundraise to make more money that would equate to the uh, increases that you're seeing now, the 151 and the future increases. And, and that's fine, Dave, and, I, and that's the explanation I'm looking for. And I guess what you're telling me also is for the last two years, you have not been able to make any contributions to your savings account. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a question about your capital list. Um, I assume that the capital purchase category has a list of assets that are covered by that. Is that correct? Yes, and I can provide you, uh, it won't be today, but I can provide you with an actual list. Uh, Dr. Okay, Horner, what the needs question to be placed. I, okay, thank you. The question I have is, what is the minimum value of the asset um, that qualifies to be on that list? What dollar figure is that? I don't think we actually have set one on that. Uh, okay. I believe it's, we're trying to keep it around $2,500 to $3,000. Okay. I don't think we have an exact number that okay, we've so, been going up. So the items that you um, replace using your operating expenses are items that cost somewhere less less than $2,500 to $3,000. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah. If it's a, a you know a, a tool an appliance or something like that that we need for the fire trucks that are under that, then that would come under the fire expenses. And then, if I understand what you said earlier, that your air bottles and such are not considered apparatus. There are certain items that qualify as apparatus, and certain items that are used every day that are not. Is that correct? Well, the the. Uh, Apparatus, we consider that as vehicles. So oh, whether okay. it's an ambulance, a ladder truck, a utility truck, a fire engine, a rescue truck, um, there are the SCBA bottles that we're talking about. That is not something that is used every day. That is used when we have gas, when we have fires, but it's a requirement that we have to have those on the truck. And they also have to be in in date, if you want to put it, if you want to call okay. it. Okay, great. That that answers my question. Thank you. Here's, here's the assets, Steve. Here's what we consider the assets. And you might want to. Yeah, if you want to just send a copy of that, I'd be interested in seeing that. Yeah, absolutely. It goes on, you know, it is vehicles, it's heart monitors, which are fifty fifty thousand dollars a piece. Uh stretchers, which are twenty thousand dollars a piece. So yeah, uh we can we can definitely have this over to you. And, and I think the the lowest number on here is about $3,000. Okay. So I'd be, I'd be happy to send this to you guys so you can see the capital asset list. Hey, thank you. So, so I have a question regarding all this, a couple of things. Number yeah. one, uh, Steve um, and Dave, so the, uh, uh, have that, uh, we'll just call it that uh, alternate apparatus, that should have a schedule as to when uh, they need replacement, just like the regular apparatus schedule does. Is that correct? Yeah, it's on here. Yeah, so so you're basing that 45k ask well, out of for the operational budget a, out of the schedule that you're holding in your hand right now, Dave. Correct? Yeah, basically, okay. just has so, to be updated. So, but yes. So to 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 allay everybody's concerns, number one, we're actually funding two portions of their capital ask. One is per the MOU for the apparatus, and the other is coming out of the operational budget. You know, based on you know the quote unquote, for lack of a better term, apparatus that they have uh, that's uh, used on a daily basis. That's um, not the case. 
so so yeah and 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 sort of to uh, the other question that came up with regard to you know where the matching funds come from you know i'm i'm me for one i'm not interested in managing your books the only thing i care about is are you meeting the terms and conditions of the mou and that says that you match um you know 50 percent of the calculated amount uh that goes into that um, uh, reserve fund based on the terms and conditions of the mou uh, i'm only concerned about that the second the second question i want to ask was i i went back and looked at your um replacement schedule it's a minor change but uh you know you arrive at the at, at the annual uh contribution based on the projected cost of the um uh replacement cost of the piece of equipment in question divided by uh the uh life expectancy of that asset so for example uh like the ferrera pumper okay uh you know the uh projected cost right now is 697 divided by 20 years you come up with a contribution of 34850 okay and that's how it goes across the board so i did a calculation across the board and i found two two of them that were a little bit of a discrepancy one was a special ops truck uh that's not supposed to be uh replaced until 2032 but if you do the same math instead of 20833 it comes out to 125 uh and then there's one other one for the fire and police van uh you know instead of 3782 comes out to 2270 so <laughs> Those calculations added in instead of 151.020 come out to 146. Now again, we're talking five thousand dollars, but is there an inconsistency in creating uh, that particular line item on the reserve schedule? He's talking that one. No, no, you're, you're Doug. You're you're referring to all the vehicles, correct? You're talking about the 45. That's it. It's the ones that are on the apparatus list. Yes. Um, yeah, we can. So we're we're reviewing that that you sent us. Uh, by the way, we haven't gone through it exactly because you had the 151 going down for all the other years. So that's obvious. No, I'm not talking change. about that part. I'm just talking about like, for example, I'm looking at the spreadsheet right this. now, and it's a fire. Yeah, Doug, 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 is it Dick? Somebody. I think Doug's doing the 151,000, which is the, op the, the 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 assets. The original question was the 45,000, right? Uh, yeah, we, we're we're past that. John. We're past that one now. We're okay, past so that now one. you're on the operational. Yeah, yeah we're just, going yeah, through the. Okay. My, my claim is, I just wanted to understand the discrepancy between the 151 and what I calculated out as 146. It may not no. be that big of an issue, but I just noted. Based on the math that's been done to arrive at the 151, there's two line items on the spreadsheet where that math is inconsistent. And okay, I just wanted you, to know if there's a reason. You, did you use the 45,390 for the police van? Yes. Okay. Divided and by 20 years, comes out to 2270, not 3782. Okay, I'll have to look at that. Yeah, and the same one, look at the special ops truck. Same thing, 250K. You put a reserve balance of, um, you know, divided by 20 years of 2833, and it comes out to 12.5. So again, minor, it's five grand, but I just want to make sure if there was any, you were using a different algorithm to come up with that uh, contribution wow. number. No, we can take it, take it offline, Dave. Just, I just wanted to bring it up. Yeah, because we're working on that form anyhow, which you sent us to, to put all the numbers. So if we could take that offline, we'll get that yeah, correct. That'd be fine. And listen, I want to make a comment, Doug. Uh, you know, you said you don't care how they get to the 50% contribution. Well, we should care because where that money comes from, if it's not coming from their fundraising, my concern was that it's money built into the operational account that Ocean Pines is paying additionally. Their explanation that they're taking it from their savings account from money built up in the past is fine. But I have to disagree with you. We need to know where that money's coming from and not just that they're matching the 151 we're putting in. Well, you can look at their PL sheet every quarter and we can figure it out. Um, well, no, because it's that's the operational money. And there was no explanation as to where that additional money is coming from, except that it's come they're transferring money from their savings account for it. And that's the answer. Well, Larry, you and I just have to agree to disagree. As long as they meet the MOU, uh, I'm fine with that. And it's not costing us anything for them to meet the MOU other than our commitment to do half of it, the uh, the uh, amount. Oh, Doug, that's not true. If, <laughs> if they weren't taking that money out of the savings account and it was built into the operational account, that additional $20,000 would be coming from Ocean Pines. And now our contribution would be $171. No. It, it can't it can't become 171 larry because they it's based on the value of the apparatus it's proven every year 
Yes, R-151 would go in, but through a back door, because it's in operations, we would still be paying the addition. But again, that's that's another issue. But again, the accountability for that is what Doug was saying in the PNL. It is in the PNL. For every dollar we spend, it's in the PNL. Yeah, I understand that, Dave, but there was no explanation as to where that money was coming from. Now there's an explanation as to where the additional money is coming from. It's coming out of your savings account. That's not correct. Out of the operational account. That's correct. I'd like to uh, maybe share a little bit here and ask a question. Um, so, do you have or can you point to any industry metrics of best demonstrated practices? That basically say for the call level that we have, um, a staff of four for each shift is 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 the best practice. That's over to you, Steve. Uh, you know we, I mean we can compare ourselves to Berlin, who has that amount. Uh, Pokemoku has the four, or maybe even a little bit more. Um, so in the general area. Those are the two companies that we kind of, we are the most populated area in Worcester County in Ocean Pines. Uh, so by going off of those two companies, I would I would have to use those because they are the closest to us. So, there, so, so you're not aware of any like national standards that say for an entity that operates like you do compared to no, the rest of the there is not. That um, here's the staffing level that corresponds to the level of calls. Does the staffing level is it the same in the in the midnight shift versus the day no. shift? Those kinds of things. No, no this is about them out there. Sorry. The standards based on response time. The NFPA standards are all based on response time as it applies to what you're talking about. And and so it's your it's your. Uh, uh, it's your basis or your feel that that to respond to the, the call levels like you should, that you need to have two 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 person shifts for the three eight hours a day. That's, your, That's correct. And uh, have we been operating close to that? During the day, we are we are operating with four. Most of the time, there are some days where we just can't get the fourth person. Uh, ideally, it, it becomes a struggle and a strain on us. And as everybody should know, time is, is really uh, a big difference when we're talking about this. So a minute could mean the difference of life and death. And we've talked about this before. Um, you know, so we need to be there. And I, I believe within the South Station, we can be anywhere in Ocean Ponds within about six minutes time. And that is along with what NFPA says. I think really the fundamental, the fundamentally what we have done is we've provided you with our best estimate on what we need to protect this community from a life safety standpoint. And that's why we presented it, and we, it's it's our responsibility to present it. So, is part of the difference why you're presenting it now that basically you've lost that um, overflow from Ocean City that you could rely on in the past, but now you can't rely on? Is that why it's coming to to a head? That's right? that's part of it. Also, with the demographics here in Ocean Ponds, the median age is fifty nine point three. So yeah, the same meeting meetings last year and the year before. So I'm just kind of wondering why we're here now. Yeah, well, the volunteers are going away. I mean, COVID was a big hit. Uh, and we did, everybody across the country lost volunteers. Everybody was afraid. Uh, so we need to supplement that. This department or this community does not have the demographics that most communities with volunteer fire services do. We're not bringing in significant amounts of young people into our department. We are bringing some cadets in from the high school, but the standard across the country is for every 10 people that you get in your department, 
you're going to end up having one half of one person in five years. So basically, if we've got 10 cadets, we're going to be lucky to have one of them in five years. Where we have been recruiting is people that are moving in here who have retired from Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Arundel County, and all those jurisdictions. And they are in their 50s, and they're going to age out from operations. So we don't have the demographics here to be able to support and sustain the volunteers that we have done in the past. So let me kind of position something from a board standpoint, okay? Uh, I think it was five years ago that uh, I talked with one of the assistant chiefs when I was learning infant CPR to come down to Atlanta. And uh, they said the average response time in Ocean Pines in the South Fire Station was six minutes, okay? As a board member, and I think as a board, we have to consider that as a sacred time. And I think any discussion that does anything but increase that response time, in my mind, is off the table. We're faced with a situation where I haven't heard it said in words, but over the past year, if I was going to put words into the chief's mouth, it would be that at some point in time in the future, and it may not be that far, we are looking at a full-time paid fire department to protect our community. 100% correct, Mr. Daly. Okay, so I think we should not be Mickey Mouse in around it. I think we have to address the issue. I think that first off, the community, it's a cornerstone of the community for to have public safety. And I think that this whole discussion needs to be framed this way. Our response time is six minutes. To, res to maintain that response time, we need this level of staffing and that is this level of cost associated with it. Now we can talk about the nits and nats and how what, what beans go into what pile, but at the end of the day, keeping that response time is our responsibility as a board working with the fire department. Because I'll tell you what, I don't know about how you guys feel, but I'll tell you how I feel about money. If I'm laying on the floor and can't breathe, I don't give a rat's ass about how much money I saved on the assessment to get somebody from Shaw, Berlin, Washington, D.C., or Title Health. I want somebody to be there fast with the best training and the best equipment. And whether we like it or not as a board, it's our job to make sure that happens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daly. That was very well put. Thank you, sir. Frank, Frank, I don't disagree. I don't think anybody disagrees with safety is important. But what I heard from you is what I was hoping to hear from the fellow sitting around the table just there. Some data suggests that we can't see the issue. What's the initials? Oh, up top left. No, that guy right there. Oh, that's John O'Connor. Top right? Yeah. John O'Connor. I need to hear what's going on. Is there a question? I'm sorry. Where have been here, you, sir? No, I said, I, I, Frank, I don't think people disagree that safety is a primary concern. I don't think people disagree that response time is important. I think it's very important. Um, when I was asking for data, that's the kind of information I was looking for to hear from those sitting around the table in the fire department right now, why it's so important that we do go to two staffs of two for three shifts a day because of those reasons. Well, I did give you that six minute mark that we were able to get to anywhere in Ocean Pines within six minutes. Now, when you're talking EMS, <clears throat> you're talking fire, it's two totally different things. In your house fire, five minutes, it's unhabitable. You cannot live through that. Uh, so, you know, there, this whole thing is, is very important. Um, and Mr. Prone, I'm sorry, but uh, you're on record saying, why don't we get rid of the fire department? Uh, so public safety is that's very not important. true. That's not true. Steve. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. That we were all here true. when you said that. He said that at two meetings. Um, and I, I think safety is very important to this community. And we have a job to do. And, you know, we're struggling to do it. And, um, you know, the transfer agreement does say that Ocean Ponds must provide fire and EMS coverage. And again, Mr. Perone, you're on record stating that we have to have that, but we don't need to use you. So I just that, uh, that is correct. 
That is and, correct, yes. I, and we I'm very about passionate it. about this community, if you all cannot figure that out, if you haven't figured that out. I don't do this for a paycheck. I do it. I'm a volunteer. So if I can't, if I know that there's going to be a problem and we can't get to somebody and somebody dies, that's an issue to me. And, and that's where I was coming from a couple of minutes ago when I said that when I said that we feel it's our responsibility to present to you what we need to do to protect life safety in this community. So we're doing that. Should you choose not to support it? That's not on us. We're doing our job. There's a risk benefit analysis. If I, could, if I could comment. Um, I think it's good that we're, we've brought up the results of the homeowner survey. I think it's clear to all of us that safety is a priority for our residents. And we will be developing a strategic plan um, that will be informed in part by that um, homeowner survey. These are some metrics that I think we will need to focus on in developing that strategic plan. So I would anticipate that we will be communicating with the EM, EMS and the fire elements of your department to include some metrics that make sense right. uh, for the strategic plan. Because obviously each year, the cost to Ocean Pines are going to be impacted by our commitment to you know, whatever those metrics tell us we need to maintain. So thanks for the information. And I think this is a dialogue that will need to continue beyond this budget. Right. I, I want to I want to address these comments that Steve and Dave made. Let's be clear. Uh, I never said we don't need the fire department. And I did say that our DRs require us to provide fire protection, but it doesn't say we have to provide it through you guys. And that comment was made to make sure you understood that um, the, the ask in regard to the firehouse um, is going to be a difficult question for the community. And this, again, Doing my job as the president of the association, I need to make sure that what's being asked here is appropriate. Now, you know, you've given us the explanations, but, you know, the fact that you're being asked difficult questions shouldn't surprise you when you're coming to the Budget Finance Committee and ultimately the board yes. asking to increase Yes. The assessment by by about thirty two dollars per household. I didn't say it wasn't justified. What I'm trying to get across for the community, because the community is going to watch this and understand. They're going to want to know why when the final budget is done. Why the uh, fire department is costing the fire and EMS is costing the community $128 per household or 138 whatever the number is. That's what this is about. This is not about me not supporting the fire department. I've always been a supporter of the fire department. And if uh, <clears throat> the comments that I've made have offended you that deeply, sorry. sorry about that. Steve, you and I talked about it and I thought we were clear. Um, so you came up to me at our clear. banquet. I'm, I am 100% behind fire and EMS, but I'm trying to do my job to make sure that the numbers that we're talking about here can be explained to the community. Understood. Uh, you did sit here at this table and tell us that we get rid of the fire, we keep EMS. That same night, 300 Ocean Parkway burned. So... I think we're all here to get the same thing done. If Amy needs an ambulance, Amy needs an ambulance. That ambulance needs to get to Amy. She needs the fire. It needs to get there. So really, that's there is a risk, as we all know. We're trying to give you the solution. If Ocean Ponds wants to accept the risk, okay. Um, and if I could add one more comment that relates to the um, homeowner's survey, as it pertains to this discussion. Um, another top priority is transparency 
And I think what we are seeking here is transparency with respect to what these costs, these increased costs are providing to the community and you know, what are the items that are contributing to those increased costs? So, you know, just to piggyback on what Larry said, that we need to do our due diligence. We need to provide that transparency to the community. Um, thank you. Yeah, let me let me add one more thing. Just I think we need to get back on track. We've probably uh, hit this topic long enough. But, uh, you know, from a personal perspective, I, you know, I, I agree a level of transparency is required. I would dare say that if you asked an individual who's getting ready to pay his or her assessment that said in order to maintain that six minute response time and ensure safety of the uh, of the community and its membership, uh, it's going to cost you another seven dollars in your assessment. I think a high percentage of people would say, OK, I'm, I'm fine with that. Hi, hey guys, I just want to chime in. I think I understand what's happening here with, with uh, I don't disagree. Larry just wants to know where the money is being spent and, you know, uh, just to be accountable. And I think that's not a lot to ask for our community. I mean, my I've got one question, you guys have probably answered this a million times, but in a community that's being ran by ARC, how do we ever get to own a hundred foot boom truck? Just, I'm asking, I'd like to hear an answer. That's, what is it used for and how long? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. So that truck is designed. We have buildings in Ocean Pines that we cannot get to with a standard ladder. So you're looking at the Yacht Club, you're looking at the Country Club, Points Reach Condominium, all of the commercial. We need to be able to get on the roofs of these houses. Uh, even some of the bigger houses, Turns Landing, uh, Wood Duck. So that's why that ladder truck was actually purchased. Don't we have a 68 foot? We had, what was that, Hunter, uh, Harvey, 80, 75 at one time? We had a 70-foot one a long time ago, uh, but buildings are getting bigger. And with this, we're able to be back far enough for safety that we can actually get on the roofs of these buildings. And the other thing is there's a standard nowadays. We, um, we are purchasing to the industry standard at any point in time. So we are not only... It would be it would not be to our best interest if we purchase something that does not meet a standard. We wouldn't be serving the community the way we need to serve the community in accordance with the National Fire Protection Association. So as a result, you, you have what we have, what we need to support the community as well as to meet the standards of the industry. So just that, just just you know uh, just to go on to that, if I had to pull into your driveway. Pull mm -hmm. straight in. I'm going to lose 40 foot automatically. Okay, from that ladder being able to reach the building. So that's why okay. we decided to go to 104. It's actually 104 foot rather than a 70 foot. Okay, arc is under four. So, but I know that's a good. Um, yep. I get what you're saying. I mean, you got to consider the truck, and I hadn't thought about that being a part of the reach. Uh, think about you would have. Sorry, man. You know, think I about a, the, think about a right angle triangle, okay? With the right yeah, angle, I, the ninety degree angle being the front of your structure and the ground, and then the the, the other angle being the actual ladder itself. Hypotenuse. So in many places, you know, at Points Reach Condominiums, that's that's that Steve mentioned, we could back our ladder truck off. Um, with the with the rear of the truck up to points reach and reach high above the roof. That's absolutely true. But with that triangle, some of the condominiums we have to go to, some of the multifamily structures, the structures out in Wood Duck 2, the structures in the inner links, we don't have the quite the access all the time to get to those places. Plus, if the building is truly on fire, there's a heat issue. So we want to get basically the base of the truck, the truck itself, a little bit away from that heat, have a safe triangle because part of the, we have this, we have this truck for a couple of reasons. One, it carries a bunch of tools on it, carries a bunch of ladders on it. It can pump water. It can pump a lot of water. Two, we use that for rescue. So if you're on the third floor, we could come up to that third floor and put you in a safe area, the platform or the bucket, as some people call it, and we'll be able to get you down to the ground. So that's why it's a large truck. It's a little bit overkill, 
you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't for the average single family home at Ocean Pines. Sure, it's overkill. We don't necessarily need it. But if you drive around Ocean Pines and look at how far uh, these large, expensive homes are away from the street that we don't have access to and we don't have a safe place to put our truck down where it's not going to lose its center of gravity and balance, then we have to be away from it a little bit. And so that's why the 104 feet. Could we do with one that's 50 feet? Yeah, but we're not going to be able to get you on the third floor. Okay. Just because of that reach, that's just because of that access. Okay. I appreciate the explanation. I, I I hadn't really, I'd given it some thought and I had done the math knowing that it's under 40 feet, the recommendation, yeah. but I had Come take a ride. I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> come to Seriously, come take a ride. I'll show you. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. George? Uh, yeah. Go back to revenue and some of these may be dumb questions, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Uh, you know, you're looking at, you said you had 1,920 EMS calls, 400 and some were not transported, so we received no revenue from those. Do other EMS squads charge for those calls if they come in, like Berlin and Fort Worth and so on? So there, I'm sorry. So, so in, in general, no. I know in Sussex County, if, a, if an ambulance in Sussex County comes to your house and, and you refuse service, they treat you and release you, you know, whatever, they can bill you. They're allowed to bill you for mm -hmm. that money. You're not allowed to bill the insurance. That's illegal. All right. So yeah. actually, this conversation came up with uh, with with me and the and the, the company that does our billing the other day. And I, and I talked to him about the legality of doing that. And then I calculated it out. So um, those 458 calls with patient contact and no transport, if we build each one of those people $50, it's only $22,000 and change. It's not a ton of money to meet our needs. Are we allowed to bill those people that, yes, we came to you, no, you didn't want us, so here's a bill for $50? Yes, we're allowed to do that. We just can't bill their insurance. But most places do not no. bill for that. It's, yeah. it's kind of the cost of doing business, unfortunately. Um, Again, I'm not recommending. I've just seen if we benchmark and what others do. And so I know that Sussex County, the the pride, the uh, the fire departments in Sussex County do it. Worcester County, no one in Worcester County is billing for those non transports. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we talked last at, at the BNF meeting last week or the week before, whatever it was. I don't remember. Uh, balance billing for deductibles on those calls. So uh, we talk. I'm sorry. Talk a little bit about that. Did yes, sir. Go back, maybe and look at that and see how many uh, deductibles that we did not get paid out because it was deductible and we don't uh, balance bill for that. Is so that it's it? a little bit of a complicated um, algorithm that we use. So we, um, our billing company, Medical Claim Aid, they bill everyone's insurance that we transport. If that person, patient, has a secondary insurance, we bill that insurance. Right. Now, uh, I'm gonna use the term adjustment. So if you get an explanation of benefits from your insurance company that says, oh, you got billed $400, but we're only gonna pay two, that $200 adjustment, no one can collect that, it's illegal. Right. All right? Yeah, but well. if, they, if they pay 150, there's 50 left over, all right? So what we do here in Ocean Pines, per the memorandum of understanding and part of our agreement with the budget, is if you are a homeowner or a resident who lives, uh, who's the homeowner's family, you don't get a bill for that extra money. If you don't own the home, if you're a renter or if you were in a car crash, we do bill for that extra money. So I do have a couple of reports here, and I can tell you um, fiscal year 21. We had mandatory, so we billed $727,000. We had mandatory write-offs, those adjustments of $227,000. Um, and then we had the amount of money we cannot bill per our agreement with Ocean Pines Association of $47,000 and change. So $47,000 um, that we do not bill the folks that are here in Ocean Pines because they pay their assessment. Does that make sense? No, I'm with you. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. One more, one more question again and again. Yes, sir. No problem at all. 
Title health has all those building notes. Yes, notes. they do. We talked about this last time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and AGH is going to build a new building on the other side of us. Yeah, that's what they say. For donation. It's called impact fees. We do not get impact fees for, from the county. I'm sorry. That, that would be impact fees, and Worcester County does not does not get impact fees from these developers to pass on to the local fire and police. That's something that really should be done, and it is done in most counties. Okay. I guess. But it's not done here. County commissioners about it. Uh, you know, you know they put the, all those buildings there, and again, ADH is there. You guys are going to, there's a fire there. Guess who's going to be there? It's us. That's right. We were there the other night. Yes, sir. That's right. You know, it, it just seems to me that we should get something when they need to get these buildings. I really that yep, sure so, seems, seems that way to us, too. Yeah, we agree, but I, I don't know what we can do. <laughs> well, well, as long as we're talking about revenue. Um, Thank you. Uh, I, mean, I, I don't have any answers, but I, I, these are just questions that came to my mind. Yeah, so so we, we know there's no change in revenue. And we know that we have a significant significant increase in costs. So 200 or 300 dollars um, And you submitted the budget with increased staffing to, to respond to the calls that you made. No, I, I I do find it kind of difficult uh, to accept that uh, you know Ocean Pines is here being asked to su to supply the whole difference for the shortfall here for the staffing that we need to do. Um, we have zero money coming from zero additional money in this budget coming from eight money or third party billings or even other. We know that inflation today is everywhere. I mean, it's going crazy as we're looking at all different aspects of the budget. Um, but yet our revenue is flat. Um, and I know we've had the practice to bill for insurance starting back in 2009. Um, you know, these are really a lot of questions that, that I don't have answers for, but questions that should be pursued. But, you know, what, what can we do differently to increase our revenues from either the county state, or through our buildings. Um, you mentioned last time that, and I think you maybe today too, that there are some fire calls where there's some accidents and so forth, where some municipalities bill for those. We don't. Yeah, well, maybe we should consider doing that. Um, I don't know how much we're billing uh, for ambulance calls, but I know some places bill thousands and thousands of dollars for ambulance calls. They don't collect it all, but certainly I think we should be billing the maximum we could bill, and let the insurance company adjust it down to what they're going to pay so we don't get short changing. And maybe we're doing that. I don't know. Um, what is the practice for, for um, uh, what's it costing us for, for people that don't have insurance that we transport to the hospital? Is that significant? Um, last time we mentioned, and I think we alluded to today, the changing infrastructure here in 589, and how we're being asked to transport people from different medical facilities and so forth, and and that's being picked up. It's really outside of the homeowners here. It's now you have the public you're transporting, and Ocean Pines is being part of that. Um, you know, maybe we go back to the state, to the county, let's say here. And basically try our best. We talked about maybe a team of representatives and the fire department representatives going back with a strategy that really argues on a case that we really have a higher level of cost here. We do have a higher level of cost. Damn it, 47% more. That 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 presents an argument that you know some more money should be coming our way. Uh, you know, th these are a lot of questions. I think we really need to go back to the drawing board. And, and basically see what can we do differently to raise these fees, whether it's EMT billings or whether it's money from the state or county, what can we do differently other than saying we need this money because this is the level we need to work at and we're trying homeowners, hey, well, what are the alternatives? What can we do differently? Um, that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see if you guys can, you know, 
we could go back and think this over and come back with maybe some recommendations on changing some of our policies. Now, the 2009 policy has been with us consistently. Maybe it's time to change that. But, or maybe not, but at least look at alternatives that might generate some additional revenue that can help reduce the cost to the Ocean Pines homeowners. I'd like to address part of that because at either the last meeting or one of the four meetings we've had on the budget, uh, we talked about the Board of Directors of Ocean Pines with the support from the fire department and the police department going to the county commissioners with exactly what you're talking about, which is when the county approves a development, a new building, a hospital, uh, whatever you want to call it, that there be developer impact fees, which come back to the association to provide for fire and police services. And we did talk about that. Well, you know, that's something that we should formalize and, and, and pursue it. That's just one area from the county, but also on the, on the EMT billing side, what, what opportunities to think out of the box and, and change the status quo. What can we do differently that can maybe help reduce some of the cost burden here? And, and I, I don't expect you can answer that right now, but it's something that 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 I think needs to be thought about and uh, and some some recommendations come forward with uh, maybe some alternatives. So if, if I may, uh, I am the, the chairman of the Worcester County Fire Chiefs Association. Every year we do meet as chiefs uh, and take our needs to the commissioners. So every year we do go to them asking for more money. Sometimes we do get it, sometimes we don't. I don't know what's going to happen this year if we, um, if we are going to get anything additional or not. The fire funding set at 300000 that's been stagnant, and that is something that I am really – pushing the county to increase since we get $215,000 plus $35,000 for a total of $250,000. The other $50,000 is made up of pass-through funds, which means anytime that we go outside of the gates of Ocean Pines, it's an extra $1,000. So we run about 50 of those calls a year. So that is something that we are aggressively doing every year on a yearly basis with the county. Right. So, the state Amos funding, that's preset. That's not going, that goes up a little bit every year. Uh, the county EMS, that's, you know, we're we're trying as a chief association um, to move forward and get more money. And talking with uh, Commissioner Bertino, the county is working on some other things down the road. We just don't know what they are yet. So we are trying every year to get more money from the county. Yeah, I, I hear that. Um... But um, it, 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 can we do something over and above that? People from Ocean Pines have contacts with the government, relationships with the government, and the county officers and things like that. Um, can we jointly um, strategize and put together a case that maybe will resonate, you know, with some people? I, I'm willing to try anything. I really am. I, you know, any, but like I said, we do do this on a yearly basis. We we take all of our requests uh, at the county level to the commissioners, um, and we all meet with them as fire chiefs, presidents, and EMS captains. Uh, whether or not they adopt what we want, it's hard to say. We just don't know. What what, what about on the on the EMT billing side? Going back, I'm looking. So those two things, sir, that we that I mentioned earlier, um, one of those is the agreement that if somebody, you know, uh, if you own a piece of property in Ocean Pines, you're the patient, um, we don't balance bill you. We don't bill you for that extra. We don't bill you for that copay. So there's that one thing. You're looking at and, that. And, and those are, you know, that's that's $47,000 this past year. So so there so there's that amount of money. I'm not sure how accurate that that actual number is, but that's the number I'm getting from the billing company. And then those 458 calls where we went to Miss Jones house and picked her up and, and and got her, you know, organized and safe and and make sure her needs were met the best we could. She did not need to go to the hospital or did not want to go to the hospital. Uh, bill Miss Jones for that or if Miss Jones has a diabetic emergency and we go and treat her 
um, give her some some medication and, and make her feel better, get her back to orientation she's taken care of, then she doesn't want to go to the hospital. Same thing, bill that person. We cannot bill their insurance, but we can bill them. So that would make a small bridge to what we're talking about. What, what um, happens? What happens yeah, I understand that. Thank you for sharing that. What, what happens if a private ambulance company comes to you? Be my own. And there's no transport and they provide some services, whether it's five other services or whatever. They built that or they can't build for that either? If they transport the, I'm sorry, I don't understand. You were broken up a little bit. Let's say that a private ambulance company, for profit ambulance company, goes out to make a call and um, uh, no one's transported. Maybe it's a diabetic situation, the patient's comforted and so forth. The patient stays home and the ambulance was at the headquarters. Do they bill for those things? You know what, sir? I can't answer your question because the closest third service, that's called a third service in the in the world of uh, field EMS. The closest one is American Medical Response, and they respond basic life support units in Washington, D.C. Any advanced life support uh, would, be, would be taken care of the Washington, D.C. Fire Department. So I'm sure that they do bill for some of their services, um, but if they don't transport the patient by Medicare law, by government law, they cannot bill the patient if they don't transport them. So let me understand, and I think cut to the chase of this. Okay, so I'm in Orlando right now. So I just heard a bunch of fire engines go by, and that's paid by the city of Orlando tax. Okay, we are not a city. So basically, I believe as far as you, the fire department, is concerned in Ocean Pines, the funding for you is going to come from Ocean Pines and the county to fill down from the state and what other fundraising you do. So it seems to me that that although we can nibble around the edges, okay, by billing some people we don't bill now and create a little, you know, kind of like catwalk, not a bridge, that the big issue is countywide. If I understand last year, the commissioners gave an extra one million dollars to be divided amongst the firefighting districts. Is that correct? Roughly. Yeah. Yeah. Ocean so, City got a Ocean City got a most of that money. Yeah. I mean, we're looking at a situation to me, and correct me if I'm wrong from your point of view, Chief. The, it costs a lot of money to provide life support and fire and to fight fires. That money has to come from, if you don't have volunteers, from full time fire people. It seems to me, countywide, if I'm reading things correctly, we have a kind of mini crisis brewing in that almost all the districts are hurting for volunteers. This is That's a national correct. crisis, sir. It's a national, a national crisis. crisis. Right. And in fact, one of the things if I read really, if I read into what I've heard over the past year, is we are more likely to be called now into Shao because Shao has some crisis situations or manpower situations. And I think this is a situation where the community has to, quite frankly, belly up to the bar, and we have to work with our two commissioners to get the county to belly up to the bar because it's not going to go away soon, and I don't think it's going to go away at all. No. I mean, it, you know, I don't know if it's five years, ten years, five months from now, but I suspect in not too distant future when I hear that fire engine, it's going to be like here in Orlando. It's going to be paid by the community for full-time firefighters. You guys can tell me when you think that's going to be based on a trend line, but I, that's where I see the trend line heading to. Is that correct or am I off base? You are absolutely correct, sir. I've been, I've been involved with this fire department for 41 years, and I can tell you that I've never seen in that 41 years the low manpower status of volunteers that I see today. So I, I think that and I address this to both the fire department and to my fellow board members. Look, we got to do a little job with the community. We talked about transparency. I think the community has to understand what the response time is, our commitment to maintaining the response time, what the cost of maintaining that response time is going to be, what the future kind of looks like. Because I would suspect if I were a betting person, we'll be having a similar discussion, if not next year, the year after. Because it's going to be a long-term situation that we're dealing with. 
and we need a plan. It's, you know, and it's not a short-term plan. We need a long-term plan. And if that long-term plan is that we're going to have to go to a full-time paid fire department in Ocean Pines, let's start laying the groundwork for it now so somebody doesn't act real surprised when it happens. Yeah, Frank, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. We actually had a very similar discussion in the previous meeting. Uh, it turned out with sort of the concept part of it now, it sounds like perhaps we got enough um, background information to turn that from concept into something that's tangible. So I, I would agree with you. I think we need to do it from a board perspective. From a, uh, to certainly accept any uh, input from the Budget and Finance Committee uh, working in conjunction with the folks in the fire department to get to the county commissioners and say, guys, this is a known problem. I know you know about it. How can we collectively address it going forward, both now in the short term and certainly for the long term? So I I'm all in on that as well. Yeah, and I would piggyback on that by saying that the discussions that the fire and EMS people are having with the county, I think would be benefited by having Ocean Pines at the table with them as well, because we ultimately are a big funding source for you. And, you know, we have an interest in the same things that you have an interest in, making sure that the turnout times are meeting national standards, making sure your equipment meets national standards. And, and I think the more voices at the table from different perspectives, perhaps the more persuasive it will be with the county. I think it's a two-forked approach. One fork is what the chief is talking about, where the chief's association, as well as the county fire association, which is largely the chiefs, the presidents, and the EMS captains, where we go as a as a service to the commissioners. I think the other thing that's more that is equally as important is if Ocean Pines itself, which includes the board of directors leading the effort and the fire and the police supporting that effort. To go in to go to the commissioners, so I think that's really two approaches that need to occur. Agree. I do. Thank you. Agree. Okay. Uh, if there's no more EMS questions, do, would you prefer that we go through this line by line, or would you just simply like to ask questions? Because as you can see. There's a little bit of a difference in the operating expenses from 21-22 to 22-23, but it's not as significant as what you had just talked about. But if you wish, we can go through this line by line. Why, why don't you continue going through it line by line? Okay, so member expenses, which is the first category, that's a number of different things. That includes, that includes our one annual banquet that we have, but it also includes apparel. We are uh, we are basically providing a lot of apparel that we have to do for our members because from a Homeland Security standpoint, we have to have our members on the scene identifiable. Uh, so therefore, we provide we uh, job shirts, shirts, et cetera, et cetera, for our members. So those type of expenses all jump into that category. We require physicals of all of our members on an annual basis. And that's that $7,000 that stays the same. Of course, utilities are utilities. Um, Steve, you wanna talk repair and maintenance? That's the building, you wanna handle that part or, and I'll do that. Okay, repair and maintenance is, is the building. Uh, as you can see, we increased it somewhat. Um, those of you who have been to our building or have discussions with us, realize how uh, what, a, what a situation that we are in with South Station. South Station was built in the 70s, had one addition added onto it. It is falling apart. Part of the building is sinking. Uh, to give you an idea of what we had invested in last year, we had gas-fired uh, heating units in the bays, and the gas pipes fell out of the ceiling. So the building is deteriorating rapidly. So well, this is a Band-Aid on a hemorrhage where... We believe that the investment we need to make this year is the $8,000, 80,000, sorry. You wanna do communications? Yeah, so 4607, communications, maintenance, uh, that is for our radios, mics, et cetera, uh, straps for the radios. 
4,700 fire expenses, and that includes the fire police expense, cadet uh, turnout gear uh, is a big thing. That stuff does expire. We have to replace that every 10 years. Uh, department uniforms, that is our Class A uniforms uh, that we provide the members and employees. And I'm going to let Harvey, if you'll do um, your 4,800 and 4,804. So EMS expenses, basically, uh, we follow the state MIMS standard for minimum equipment on an advanced life support ambulance. We have three advanced life support ambulances. That includes uh, equipment to equip those ambulances, replacement of that equipment, and then um, maintenance contracts, uh, our heart monitors, our Lucas devices, which you may know as thumpers, uh, things like that. Our stretchers uh, have annual contracts, so that money is all in there. Um, and then the billing is uh, we we pay 8% of what medical claim aid collects on our EMS billing, so that's where that number comes from. The building insurance is uh, uh, has increased a little bit. As you uh, probably know, the board recommended that we look at Dealey uh, insurance, and we did. We have hired Dealey to uh, handle our insurance, and uh, the price has gone up uh, a little bit this year. Training is for the equipment and that we would buy for training purposes. The department trains once a week. There's training uh, every Tuesday night uh, other than meeting nights. And we have drills. We have drills on a weekend, et cetera, et cetera. The $6,000 if we have to build stuff to uh, for the training purposes like building props. Uh, apparatus maintenance, 5000 Um We've increased that. Well, I'm a uh, line item 5,000. Okay, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, we increased that from 58 to 70. We're from May 1st to December 18th, we're already pushing $37,000 in apparatus maintenance. And if you can imagine how expensive it is to have your car worked on, just imagine a fire truck. Tires are very expensive, et cetera, on that. Office expenses, we were able to take that down about $5,000. Public, okay. public education. Okay. That um, That's our fire prevention, books, helmets, stuff that we do to go to the schools. Uh, that's It's increased as well as far as cost goes, so that's why we allocated $5,000 for that this year. The professional fees are our uh, accountant, our auditor, and our lawyer fees, and that pretty much stayed the same. Fuel? Uh, fuel, we increased two grand on that because of the cost of fuel. Uh, and special events, what special events, what that category includes is if we have a hurricane, we have a snowstorm, we do need to bring extra personnel in. Also, 4th of July, any type of uh, special event here in Ocean Pines that we need to increase manpower, bring volunteers in off the street. So that's what that category is with a total of $516,000 this year. Harvey? So uh, to the biggest problem, problematic part of our budget is uh, is our compensation-related costs. And I can tell you that um, as I spoke to the committee members that were here last time, um, the way the budget was done for a lot of this before was taking an employee's base salary, multiplying it out, um, and getting information from that, which is how last year the request was $238,000. This year, based on actual expenses or actual projected expenses for all the employees with the addition of the two additional employees we're requesting and the two that we put on full-time from part-time, we increased the total salary uh, estimate, assuming that each of the current employees gets a, a, a step cost of living increase this year. With that number is the... Below that number, below the 4202 number, is the Medicare and FICA separated out. We used to put it all together. Um, the insurance deductions, we have a HSA plan, and the department um, gives the employee the deductible for either themselves or the family for the, for the uh, for their deductions from their care first uh, insurance. Um, and then the actual insurance for those folks, which includes uh, additional employees, um, their families, whoever they had decided to put on there, which is some vision, some dental, things like that, which is where, that's where the 150 comes from. The pension is actually 8% of each employee's gross salary. 
<clears throat> um, which is estimated for next year. Workman's compensation, uh, I calculated that as $3,700 and change per employee, per full-time employee. EMS training uh, is a big increase because what I did this year, nationally registered paramedics are required to attend 60 hours of training each two years. So all I did was take all the employees' uh, hourly rates, not subject to overtime, and multiplied them by 30 hours for one year. That's how I came up with that number. EMS uniforms, We are each employee is allowed to spend up to $400 per year for uniforms. Uh, we don't give them that money. We They have to order it through us. So if an employee only needs $100, we only spend $100, but they're allowed um, $400 each. And then I estimated $200 for those NFPA-required employee physicals every year. I have a couple questions on this. Yes, sir. Uh, why was under the Medicare and FICA number, why was there no number in there last year? So, and the same with the insurance deductions. So if you look down at, sir, if you look down at 4,400, the last year it was 238,364. So that um, that budget was carried over from when Mr. Bounds was here based on employees' base salaries and things like that. And in doing, in doing my homework for this and the, the increased staffing, I separated all that money out and tried to take actual figures from our insurance companies um, from our actual salaries, from our actual overtime costs, and put all those numbers in there. So the numbers that I came up with for this year were actual numbers projected for next year. Any other questions uh, regarding the compensation and related costs? We've already gone through the rest of it. We've gone through the revenue. And then the gray area on the right-hand side is simply the operating expenses, compensation expenses, apparatus replacement, and capital, which we already covered, minus the revenue above, which comes out to, as you see. Are there any further questions? Over to you. Okay. If there is no other questions, and I think uh, Joe kind of got into the apparatus or the replacement reserve, um, I don't have anything on my end. Everything here, they explained the increase mostly on the personnel. Anything else, Dick? No, I don't. I'm not hearing anything. Other all questions right. here? Okay. We're all ready. We will send if Steve Steve has the payroll, the benefit and overtime stuff he is going to send out to the entire board. Uh, Dick, I'm not sure if you have all that or if your team wants it, but um, we're going to send that to the board. Anything else we need to send out to anybody? OK, thank, thank you very you much. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, gentlemen. You. OK, Dave, thank, thank you. Bobby, thank you. We're all part of a process. Thanks, all right, so you know on, uh, what is it, the 19th and 20th or whatever? Mm -hmm. You know about that? Does the board uh, review? Yeah, uh, yeah. I think we're done, aren't we? No, oh, wait, wait, we're actually, hold me. we're not done, hold on. Yeah, 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 hold on, we have Steve here. Okay. Right, guys. Okay, Thank yeah, call me to something. So yep. Steve's here, he's anxious to go through food and beverage. He's got some really good numbers. <laughs> some variations. And um, thanks, guys. So the food and beverage, and again, this is all part of the process, which I was just explaining to the fire department, too. This is for the community. Uh, they will come back for the board presentation, even though there were a lot of board members. I explained all that, but it will help the process. So with that, food and beverage, Ralph was in. He's out of town. Uh, his team's out of town. We did do a dry run with BNF. This is part of the process. Steve, who's, the, who's my liaison, our liaison to food and beverage, is going to go through the food and beverage numbers with everybody. Um, so here we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm not going to go through it line by line. Uh, Ralph was in here <clears throat> for the BNF, but for purposes of giving everybody the opportunity to, of course, ask questions, um, you know, definitely let's go to each section. And um, 
I can give you an overall summary, but I guess the easiest one to start with might be beach club uh, and clubhouse. <laughs> so if we go to beach club, which is tab 18, for those of you with binders, um, you can see what, <clears throat> what Ralph derives for the beach club gives us a, uh, a bottom line in the proposed budget of uh, $124,000, which is an improvement you can see versus the 22 budget. Um, it is actually <clears throat> uh, below where we where we estimate to come in this year, which is about $150,000. Ralph did did want to hedge that. Basically, talks about the COVID rebound on the beach club side. You also have a big aspect of good weather on weekends. Um, you know, everything kind of came together this year. Not sure if that's a record, but, you know, 197,000 to date is the best I've seen since I've been here and, and the best I've seen in the historicals. Um, so that's what we have in there. Of course, the management fee consists of a, a, I did put a little bit of a portion in the estimate for the uh, end of year projected payout. That's why you see where we are in September versus the estimate coming down about 40 some thousand dollars. And then before I get into the other ones, just to kind of put it out there in the past, and this is something that Dick and team, I think, are aware of, uh, you know, we budgeted based on contractual numbers. Yeah, I was going to get into that. You want me? Uh, sure. Yeah. So actually, I was going to start off with that, but and I just need you to put this into perspective. So the budget, so the contract for the year we're in, for them to make their um, their bonuses and all that, I believe is what, 195 190. Yeah. It's 190. It was 175. If you all remember, we gave them the extra year last year, and I asked them or I requested that they increase the goal to 190. So, in the beginning, or several years when it first started, we didn't know where we were at or anything. We budgeted to the contract. We all agreed on that. He does have history now. So, he's coming in overall for the three, three locations somewhere above the the contractual amount of 190 operating profit for all three locations but he is he's not at the numbers that we're forecasting this year and i believe i believe it's 150 steve for the beach club not 197 for the forecast you might have got the yeah 197 is where we are right so it's 150 so he is coming in lower steve touched on it he calls it the COVID uh, kick where he believes there was this pent-up demand my words that everybody rushed out and we may not have that again He's also, uh, he has hedged uh, as far as, I'll use my own terms, not his, the numbers for, as far as revenue would be soft in the sense of what I've explained for all, my opinion, for all the amenities in the sense that they're concerned about COVID, they're concerned about something. So we kind of have a, a hedge built in there. He has one built in there. You'll see at the end how much it is, um, but he's way favorable to the contract, all right? Um, his, Steve, just his margins, everything else, his payroll, all that has been pretty much in line or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the margins there, I have them out there on that under net revenue. You can see 74% pretty consistent uh, to last year's budget to how we ended 2021 and also our 22 estimate. Um, so no real uh, <clears throat> anomalies to to what I've see, what I see here. All right. So any questions on Beach Club? In general, Khan is there. You know, if you go back to history with the Beach Club, even before the the dark years or whatever that happened like four or five years ago, we always made John, what did we make there? About 100,000 at the Beach Club, just pretty much operating. So he is coming in. He's coming in around 125. He's going to do 150 this year. Assume the number next year. It's everything equal in the universe. He'll be somewhere in between the two. Any questions on Beach Club? Okay, straightforward. It's a money maker. What's next, Steve? Uh, we can go to Clubhouse. Clubhouse Grill, number. Number seventeen. Seventeen, please. Okay, so our bottom line did go up here, uh, pretty much in line with what we're estimating for this year. Uh, sales, though, do go up. Um, you can see that we uh, had a budget of 23,000. We're estimating to come in a bottom line of 61. And basically that's what we are uh, 
proposing for next year as well. Okay, so again, hey, Steve, John, is that number is that number good? I mean, we're we're looking. You have year to date September. Um, at yeah, so four, and then you're putting the end of year at sixty one three. Yeah, so you can see sales. I mean, Ralph filled this out in terms of projected sales. So you can see the sales go from two ninety seven to three fifty three. I'd have to. I mean, it, you know, we did this estimate probably what about a month ago to see where we where we landed in November to see if we need to adjust that a little bit further. But um, you know, from a bottom line standpoint, uh, we still got some of the fixed costs that we got to put in there. Um, uh, you know, you're still going to have your regular payroll. Um, so it, it just happens to come out uh, as a wash and <clears throat> for March, you know, some of the slower months in there that you're actually going to have a loss. So there'll be a number of months of losses in there. So we, yeah, we still have March and April. I mean, I don't know that there'll be losses. That's okay. All right. Yeah, I mean, you know, it could be a little bit better. I mean, he, he, Ralph, I mean, you know, likes to under promise over deliver. <laughs> <laughs> That's his key motto. So, I mean, you know, our, our estimates already coming in a surplus of, I guess, about one little over a million. Um, so, I mean, it could even be higher than that. Uh, keep in mind, though, as that goes up, then we have to split the bottom line. So every yes. You win a million dollars. No, no, he's talking about the overall. I know, John. He's talking about the overall surplus for all of Ocean Pines, not for food well, beverage. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 John, I, I, duly noted, John. I, I thought the same thing. I was. <laughs> yeah, and I think you're right. I think you're right, Steve. It really doesn't matter because. It really doesn't matter because. Uh, right. Uh, if the revenue goes up, then our split goes up too. Right. Right. The other thing is keep in mind, and we all agreed to this, and I certainly think it's the right thing, is that they keep their staff employed the full year. Um, and that's why they have a staff and a very good staff. So there is a cost in the in, in the down years. Uh, you know, it's the FAGA model. Um, so you're going to have that. Uh, yeah. Okay, so... Um... John, if John, if we add the three together, the proceeds for the next year's budget comes to two eighty. Right. Is that well above his obligation or his? Yeah, so his right. So the kick in that fifth year is one ninety, an increase of fifteen thousand from the original contract. So he he's definitely coming in higher than that, and that's a net number after everything's uh, split to fifty fifty. Steve, so he's he is he, he's higher than that. Uh, you're going to see that that budgeted number is less than the forecast this year. Um, and I stand by what I said, all the amenities, um, there's there's kind of a, a hedge in there for COVID and all that. Whereas last year, I tried to keep that kind of hedge out of there and said, look, we'll use the surplus to cover it. This year, you know, we're going to use the surplus, the realized surplus to cover, hopefully, uh, and get the board and everybody else to agree that we're fully funded with the reserves maybe we find out that uh you know we got favorability there so we'll find that out tomorrow but yeah he's 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 forecasted to come in even more than that but to put it in perspective he's going to be 90 100 with his promised budget over the contract yes it's a it's a good story yeah and he'll his words and steve said it uh under promise over deliver. So I think he's telling us, say, look, if anything, everything being equal in the world, I'm going to do better than this. I have a question though, that, uh, the, the over promise, I'm under promise over deliver. That's what he said, impact, yes. The, the, what impact does that have on his bonuses? So, so saying yeah, no, that the no. It's half, so, so, okay, so that's good. So, right, so, so again, he doesn't lose anything right now, but if he comes in a hundred favorable to the number that whatever that number was that Dick said, you figure he gets half and we get half after all the expenses for payroll and all that. His management fee doesn't change. Uh, obviously the bonus does, and he's in that territory where we split everything 50-50. So it's 50 grand to him. Go ahead, Steve. Anything, but I think, I think, of anything that's in excess of the budget, 
We should no. If no, not the, hold on, hold on. No, so I mean, I think what you're asking is this budget has no impact on his what he would potentially make as a bonus. He it's contractually bound. We've already agreed to that number, so we're setting this budget based on his expectations. The contract number of one hundred ninety thousand dollars is the over and above number that we split. Right. Okay. All right. Okay. So if he's coming in at two eighty, those three numbers, I think that's what Dick said, and he does another hundred. The 380, I, I thought that's what John O'Connor was asking. What does that mean to him if he does another 100 favorable? Then he would yes, there is get another 50,000 50, to him, 50 to us. Okay, so we split anything that's in excess of the budget. Correct. So, so, so it is it, it is advantageous to him? Not in excess of the budget. In excess Not, right. of $190,000 right. for the contract. Okay, he, right. let's get that because... It's the 190, not the budget. We don't do it on the budget. It's based on the contract. Right. right. Got it. Exactly. So, so, so it's kind of a contradiction in terms. John saying because the budget happens to be the 280, but right, John, they just want to make sure you understand it's not the budget in case it's budget. Okay. Right. And he has a flat fee, no matter what. He has a flat fee. Right. Once he reaches, once he achieves those levels, yes. Once he achieves a level. Over the contract. No. In the contract, whatever is the contract and the budget don't go together? Not necessarily. No, no. No. We did in year one, but then we rewrote right. it. Yeah. Okay. So the year, year one, well, let me just go. In year one, they had no history. I, I got came, it. Okay. That I understand. All right. So then what is it that? This is my question. He gets a flat fee for the coming year, right? Just like he did the period, period. Yes, he, correct. Okay. If he nope. exceeds the budget by a million dollars in profit, does he get any more than his yeah, flat fee? He gets 50-50, you told me. Yes, but, but I, I just need you to understand the term. Right. In this situation, because the budget is higher than the contract, when you ask me, what if he does another 100000 over this budget. Let's take the budget word out of it. Let's say that number, whatever that number was, the 290 or 280 that Dick said, that's over the contract. So it puts him into that realm where anything additional to what just happens to be called the budget number this year, the answer is 50-50. But it's not based on the pure budget. If the budget's lower than the contract, then that's a different story. Good, Steve? John, you got it? I think I have it. Uh, what, okay, I don't, so, is, what I don't understand is a contract that's talking about his bonuses that's not tied to the specific budget. That I don't understand. All right. The budget is the budget determines assessment. I'm sorry. sorry what? The budget determines assessment. Okay. But we entered into a five year. Oh, mute. I can't hear him. If he hits certain targets, his bonus is based on that contract, and it really has nothing to do with the budget. Is that right? Okay, right. so the contract has nothing to do with the budget. The budget solely for assessment. the assessment. That's correct. And has nothing to do with measuring his performance. That's correct. From a bonus ah. standpoint. Okay, so now with all that said, let's just say this: the, the number, the number in the assessment. Call the budget. The dick was how much? Two hundred eighty thousand, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Operating profit. Let's just call it operating profit, John. In this budget, the two eighty. If he does another hundred thousand of operating profit above this budget, above the two eighty, which is in the budget, which is in the budget, <laughs> which is in the budget for the assessment. If he does another, which is what I thought your your question was. If he does another hundred which would get him kind of where the forecast is this year, if I remember. I thought you asked me, what is it, what's in it for him? Well, he'd get another 50,000 and we'd get 50,000. Okay, but you both just told me that his bonus or his fee is not related to this budget at all. No, wait, the fee? His fee is in the budget. It's not, he gets a fixed. He gets a fixed fixed management fee. Fixed management fee. He's got a fixed fee no matter what the budget is, correct? $200,000. Correct. 
for the year. Phil, so comes out. Out of the budget. <laughs> then, basically, you have a contracted number that we've entered into three years ago. It's a five five year contract, okay. and we escal we escalated that target. We had a target net operating total combined income. So it's your clubhouse, your beach club, and your yacht club combined. One hundred ninety thousand dollars doesn't depend on any of the budget numbers. Profit sure. Okay, so he makes one hundred ninety thousand dollars, no matter what happens. Correct. No. No, no. He makes two hundred thousand in a management fee. No, makes two hundred thousand dollars. One at a time. He's getting one hundred ninety thousand dollars. What has to happen for him to get it? John, anything? John, what? He yeah. gets two hundred thousand dollars for operating our food and beverage operation. Okay, that's his fee. That's his fee. All yeah. right, no problem with okay. that. So now, contract. Says that if he makes a profit, if, if there is a real profit, not a budgetary profit, a real profit, a real profit, or, or certain amounts of money. For a certain amount of time. Now, my question are those certain amounts of money in this budget? They're in the contract. Are those amounts in this budget? They're in the contract. The budget has no value because you're telling me that he's going to get paid based on some set of numbers out to left field, left field, this, this side, as opposed to that side, left field, irrespective of what happened, what's in the budget. That's correct. So, why are we... Well, this, John, this... this I give up. Yeah, this I flat out give up yeah. that, that, that we have a contract paying money for the performance of our restaurants and we don't have a budget for that performance anywhere it, we, we, i guess we, we we do and that in this budget we're looking at right now and i'm looking at you look at all three of them together yeah, okay and they Got they it. total out 280 profit in that 280 profit for the three locations is his two hundred thousand dollar fee which i think happens to all be in the yacht club i think and and there's profits for him based on the scenario in the budget, which is revenues, less costs, no. profits. He just told me no. The, 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 it's the, a separate contract number, but, but nothing but, to do with the budget. But, but there's, there's, there's a bonus built right? into this That's budget. Correct. There's a bonus built into this budget. I for, understand that, Dick. I understand that. But I'm telling you that the man's bonus is not based on anything in the budget. All right? None at all. It's based on whatever's in the contract. The profits in the contract is what his bonus is going to be. Nothing to do with this budget. It's is based, based. that correct? That is correct. All right. Is that correct, John? On actual performance. I was just reading. Somebody just sent me a text. I'm sorry. Say it again. Is this correct? I was just told by Larry. Right. That the bonus that they get is predicated on what's in the contract and has nothing to do with performance to this budget. Larry just told me I was correct in that statement. Am I correct? Yeah, so let me just go okay. step by step. Okay. Okay. The, contract, the contract calls for $190,000. This is useless. Okay, anything over that, we split 50-50. I got that. Okay, then what do you want to know? I don't know what that number is. It's not in here. This is garbage. It says no value in relationship to Matt Ward's compensation. We can we can lowball it and then we say so, <laughs> so so he's coming in at two eighty. That's after we give him for any, any bonus money. He got two hundred. I got that. He's got two hundred. So then. So then, I, then what else do you want to know? What what exactly do you want to know? The number is where he gets them. 50, 50. What number? They're not here. Over 190, right? Okay, so so anything over 190. So if if, if Steve has in here at 180. All right. Okay, we all know what the 190 is, right? Just tell him, just raise your hand and tell me you know what the 190 is. The next. Okay, so the 190, let's use that to base the contract. So if he's bringing in this budget 280, that means he probably made 90 and 90, what he probably made 360. We had to give him half of the 180. 
That's 90, and that brings you to the 280. Ha. Ah. <laughs> Who understood that? Thank you. Okay, so what I thought you were asking was, where's the softness? And then what I was saying is, well, it could be based upon his forecast, if everything's equal in the world and he meets it again next year, there's probably another $100,000 of revenue out there, which we would recognize 50 of it that's not in this budget because he gets half of that 50 on top of the other 90 we gave him. And then this is what I think you're getting at, that 50,000, if we had that in there now, what is that, another $5 favorable on the, on the assessment? That's all I can give you, John. That's everything. Somebody had to understand that. Raise your hand. Yeah. Thank you. Set. As long as I got one of you, I thank you. John, if you want to come in, John, if you want to come in tomorrow, I'll sit down. I'll write it out for you, and you won't leave until you understand it. This book that represents the restaurant, three pieces of paper in this price book that represent the restaurant, have no connection to the bonus that you might get or he might get. Thank you. It does, and that line I call. Right, answer it. You got to talk about I couldn't hear it. Steve, go ahead. All right, I know you all got it. So, the bottom line is it's a good budget on the food and beverage. If anything, there's some so it could be soft. Um, and that's it. And he's beaten uh, the contract. <laughs> Any other questions on food and beverage? Yes, I have a I have a concern to express here on the clubhouse grill. Sorry to, to lengthen this up, but no, no, it's fine. Um, I mean, the proposed, the proposed budget here for the right one at a time, John. Come on, one at a time. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, Brian. John, John, John's gonna, gonna gonna walk away for the next sugar donut. So go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. I want to hear the grill. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the, the clubhouse grill proposed budget. He's increasing revenue by over a hundred grand, which I I am confident that he can do. There's right. still a lot of potential there in the clubhouse, right? Right. But, we're winding up with the same bottom line as last year, which means none of that hundred grand is making it to the bottom line. Are you guys comfortable with with the increase in all the expenses? I mean, his payrolls up, his cost of goods is up, his, his um, supplies and contracts are up. Um, should some of that hundred grand be making it to the bottom line for OPA? Well, let go, go to the net revenue number, right? Because we, we got to assume his, his margins are good, right? Right. So right. let's let's look at that number. So that brings us down to, wait, Steve got there before me. How much? So he's, he's 65000 up in net revenue. Right. Yeah. 40 and 100, right. So 60, 60, 65000 right? So we agree on that. So what you're saying to me is, Sorry. you know, none of that made it to the bottom line. Right. The payroll, the payroll's up 38 grand and his contract and supplies are up 18 grand. Uh, it just feels like more that that increase in revenue should be making it to the bottom line. Uh, I, I, that's my opinion. I just wanted to make sure you guys are comfortable. No. With what what you, are you showing there? Your, 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 your point is excellent. Steve's going to answer it. <laughs> I'm not going to disagree that there's there's some upside there. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right, look, we, I mean, when, he, when he comes back, we will talk to him again. But you know, he's pretty much saying, "Hey, look, I, I, I I'm telling you, and you heard him. I'm going to deliver better. Yeah. This is the man's numbers. They're still better than they have ever been. Pretty much." I truly believe it'll be the upside if there's any change. Now, obviously, there's a timing on the assessment. It might be a couple bucks. It's not a lot, though. But I, I'm not disagreeing with you, Brian. Okay, thank you. I, you know, again, the potential there at the yeah, clubhouse. He, he, what he says is, he, again, he, he keeps his staff, and we've agreed on all this. Uh, he keeps them fully employed. Obviously, at this time of the year, you got it all right, right? Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to express that concern. No, you're right, Brian. I know you guys, I know you guys – or, or understand yep. there and you're comfortable with it. So no, I, I expect these questions. They're good questions. All right. Anything, anything else? else? Right, yeah, I'm trying to think is his labor is a full year effect where last year he had some months without labor. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. I mean, we're going to see nothing but upside on that grill. I truly believe it. And especially with the golf, he sat here and told us the golf factors in there. 
All right. Okay. All right. That's it. Okay. Uh, we're done for the. So tomorrow. <laughs> John, tomorrow bring you, after the John, bring you a donut tomorrow. Um, <laughs> so tomorrow we're going to meet nine o'clock and look at capital, right? Capital, I'm going to ask, please, right on time, because uh, uh, John Malinowski has to leave. Uh, but we're going to do him first, the golf at 9 o'clock. Obviously, that's the big number in the room, and I need to address that. So 9 o'clock tomorrow, we're going to start with golf sharp. That's the big number in the room because of the, the replacement? Irrigation. Irrigation. Okay. Irrigation, which, which decisions have to be made. Um, I will certainly make recommendations as, as requested. Um, which also then affects the reserves. And I've explained that, and we have a schedule for you, of course. We always have a schedule. How to tie that in to answer the questions about the reserves that everybody's asking me on, whether it's a proposed legislation or you will want more money in there. We'll tie it all together. But I just need some input on the irrigation, and I will make a recommendation on my end. All right? All right. All right, Dick, thank you. Thank you, everybody else. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know.